There's yep. two bombs I'll drop on this episode. One, you're going to watch, they're going to connect to each other. One is I've heard that actually if, if basically I've heard Fnatic wasn't looking for an ADC this season. Upset had the gig. So I can't Got say it. more than that, but it actually wasn't that they chose Fnatic Reckless over Upset. But likewise, and this is the dodgy part, I've heard Upset could have been a Mad Lions. Right, this is going to be another episode of Summoning Insight, the flagship show of Last Free Nation, where you can not only watch all sorts of different shows like Monty's Power Spike show, obviously tomorrow, actually interesting information. We actually have actually a live time for once for Best Damn League show because since there's no LPL, we're just going to do it as a set time. So it'll be 4 p.m. CET tomorrow if people want to watch live on this very channel. By the way, if you're watching live now on Twitch, why not follow our channel? You can also sub if you want. We'll talk about some other stuff later. Then <laughs> if you watch it on YouTube, sub on YouTube, do all the notifications all that jazz also we do have a csgo channel and if you're listening on podcast apps then be sure to sub there if you like and if you're feeling generous this actually does help write a review on something like what spotify and stuff isn't it the ones that you do that on yeah uh and and apple Podcasts. also we have a tiktok channel now at last free nation it's at last free nation on, on many social medias i have a tiktok channel now at gg monte cristo and uh, I think we'll we'll probably get into this really relatively uh, relatively quickly here, but you know one of those uh, big issues has been delays of the games in the LEC for the last week, and uh, we'll have we'll have a little bit of chat about that because again it's the only place you're going to get that conversation because everyone else is st uh, state controlled media by developers like Riot Games, so we'll have a chat about that. But if you are sick of delays of game and not w watching gameplay, well. We're going to be starting a bangers only stream on my stream at Monte Cristo on Twitch. And we'll be doing VOD reviews of all of the best games and only the best games curated for you guys. So you don't have to waste your life with 35 minutes of time between games. You can just come on over to my stream and we'll watch them together and have a great time. Games from all over the world, obviously all of the major regions. And we're not going to watch the crap games. We're just going to watch the good ones. That's the whole premise this year. Bangers only on Monty's stream. So you can follow that as well. So we have lots of shows for you guys. Uh, Monty and Wolf show is back up as well now. We released the first episode of the new season yesterday. And we are also doing that live at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, middle of the fucking night in Europe uh, on Sundays. So there you go. By the way, we will also mention this later when we do the question segment. But basically, if you are watching live today, so the 24th of January, today is the last day you can do the grog coin thing we referred to on past episodes, where just go to the Discord, Inside Esports Discord, Last Free Nation now, and go and click on the grog coin lounge. And the, all the information is there, basically. Like, there's a way it's that in. everyone who was involved, as long as you get taken care of by today, it's all going to be good. And you've been sent emails and all chance so this is just a final reminder anyway we'll start the show now so obviously <laughs> remember what we talked about last week these are going to be mainly because they're all live at the same time and there's no jazz we're probably going to do lots of episodes that are just two-man episodes so what we're going to do is we're going to bring back some of the old flavor of some of the insight which is it isn't all tailored to the guests like it's actually like we watch the games and we give our thoughts so what we're going to do is we're going to do lck and lec for this episode so let's just start with lck the classic region because What's funny about this one is, Monty, man alive. One thing I do appreciate about Korean League of Legends is it is so consistent. Like, mate, when I was watching that T1 versus KT series, yep. it's like it's the same script every time. Every <laughs> single time. It always goes like this, Monty. It doesn't matter. Yeah, don't, hold on. It doesn't matter. It could be totally 10 different players. This is what will always happen in every regular season, best of three between KT and uh, T1. Remember, <laughs> you need false hope. So KT always Always wins like game one. Maybe they smash it. Maybe they draft this diff. Then they always lose game two and game three. And that's just how it goes. Like as oh, you say, players don't even matter apparently to this outcome. And and like uh, you know, game two will be really close and like exciting. Yes, and you're exactly. Like, Is he gonna two o t one? And then they get absolutely wrecked in game three. Yes, and, you know, always. I do, always. I, I do hate these comparisons because there is one of the things that tilts me 
uh, when it comes to like esports analysis. Oh, the org that, shit. Yes, of course. It's, it's the org shit where it's like, yes. no, guys, like we can't talk about G2 versus Fnatic because it's actually 10 different players yes. than it was like seven years ago or whatever. Right. And so it doesn't really matter. I mean, it tilts me in traditional sports as well, where you're like, oh, yeah, and this has the legacy of the 1985 Chicago Bears. I'm like, it fucking doesn't. Oh, it does like, not all. Half those people are dead. And also, you know, it's the only, even the owner's dead now of the Bears. Like, there is no through line between these two teams. So they do it purely for fantastical narrative reasons. But it is hilarious that it does seem there is some sort of magic around the telecom war. And it also doesn't matter how bad KT is at the oh, time. Exactly. It, it, it's always fact, competitive. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in spring last year, they yes. were pretty bad. You know, yep. they got better by summer, but in spring last year, they were pretty bad and uh, they were still playing these these close series versus versus T1. And in fact, it was if you guys remember, it was that T1 versus KT series in spring that like gave over the Kaisa to T1. Yep. It actually informed the world meta in a lot of ways yes. because T1 had to deal with uh, this weird KT style. And then they basically just were the Borg and assimilated that style and then took it to MSI. So it, it's a very interesting dynamic. I think this game, these games were also pretty fun to watch. Uh, it gave me, of course, more false hope for KT because how could it not? I mean, this team is, it's a good team. It it's is. a good team on yep. paper. And the question was going to be, and I think this is a common question that we're seeing in LCK and LEC right now, which is some players were bad last year. Uh, Keen was terrible last year uh bdd was did not have a good year last year uh han sama was awful last year and all of these players have just snap instantly bounced back it feels like in many ways and i think it goes to show that probably a lot of it was motivation within some of these teams where it was hard for them to align on a style or um, you know, feel like they were actually going to get somewhere in their careers or their, their efforts would be worth it in some way. But now that they have a fresh start, back on new teams, back on promising rosters, I think you see a lot better performance overall. And also, you have to remember, I always think like the off-season slash Worlds just makes the league season feel like it's short, but it's it's enormous. Like if people don't know, Kosan Sama didn't get to Worlds. His last game, Monty, was on the 4th of September. Yeah. That was like <laughs> over three months ago, guys. Like the reason why that's wild to me is because what you're talking about here, remember I come from CSGO, we have like a tournament every week, like two weeks. So the joke right. is like, if you were talking about someone's form like four months ago, we don't think you were an idiot. Like who cares? Like what about the last three tournaments? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's why league's such a weird game. Cause I agree with you. Like it feels like we're, we're talking as though like it was last week that he was on Team Liquid. It was ages ago now. Like he's had plenty of time to, I think how much time he could have grinded. That's like, I've heard by the way, like he, he was supposed to be grinding the fuck out of the ladder in Europe wanting so it makes sense for something like that. I I also just know that from talking to people behind the scenes who are involved like directly with that team that there was a pretty big difference of opinion particularly between Bjergsen and Core JJ about how the team's style was going to go. You know what I hear about that one to you. One of my <laughs> number one pet peeves in esports is every motherfucker does that. They put some euphemism like we kind of just weren't on the same page in terms of direction. And always I just want to be like they can't stop there because that's the most revealing thing you could ever say. Please tell me more. But they never do. Exactly. Like, we never get to I mean, find out, Monty. The obvious right. question there that we're all desperate to know is, what the fuck is Bjergsen's vision of League of Legends? Like, <laughs> my God, I've only been I trying to find out for about 10 years. <laughs> I think we do. I, know, I do. I do. <laughs> you, I will safely see and Lane. Exactly. Then have a team fight. Exactly. And since you are Asian, you win, sir. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm back to all CS I know. I True. tip my hat to you. Exactly. <laughs> a, exactly. Gentleman's, a gentleman's duel. <laughs> True. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that the the style that Core JJ likes is a more balls to the wall, aggressive, risk taking style. Assumption. Yes. And Bjergsen's style is because it, it, is, it is hard to fault him because if you think about it logically, like he was never going to win you know, um, uh, against top Asian teams. So oh. why, why even take the risk uh, you know, you know, you may know you're going to lose with certainty to those teams, but you also open up your biggest chances to win an NA because how many times has he won LCS titles because he just waited for the other team to throw into him? It's almost a guarantee. It seems faded that in North America, 
someone eventually is going to giga throw into you. And as long as you're good at catching. And so his whole style is being good at catching those throws. You yes. play passively, you pay, you play for the fundamentals and you just wait for your opponent. You group up and you wait for your opponent to make a mistake. And he's won a lot of titles doing that. So, it's, you know, honestly, for me, it is hard to argue with that. It's not a bad strategy, of course. No, listen, not only, <laughs> as you're saying, strategy. it's not yeah. only totally efficacious, but the joke is, I'll even give people a contrast and an example to show that, like, I, I think you're actually right. Because, mate, this is actually what I remember thinking when it was in 2021 when Perks played in Cloud9. I remember thinking, like, dude, he actually is having some bad games here, and sometimes they are on the wrong pitch. But it's like, it, because he's the guy who will always make, like, that clutch play at the end when you're losing. It's like, dude, they always give him a chance back in the game, though. Like, he didn't always win it. Like, you don't pull it off. But it's like, like what you're saying is so true. He must have just been sat there, like... So basically, it doesn't matter how the game goes. I just will get a chance to win the game. Okay, then. Cool. Like, yeah, if I were... You're right, Monty. If I had that in the back of my mind, like Bjergsen does for 10 years... You'd be a gazillion every you'd time. You'd be mad chill, of course, exactly. You'd be like, why don't we go for this mad aggressive, like, early, like, fucking... No, let's just... Everyone, whoa, let's calm down here. Let's just see what's going on. Exactly. De-escalation. They will do something stupid. <laughs> they will exactly. do something stupid. So, yeah, I mean, it's... it's it, I think it's a good strategy at least to win domestically. I don't I don't think that this new 100 Thieves roster is really going to give him that same chance to have titles because the level of a lot of these other teams is just too high. And previously, he had the advantage of because he was Bjergsen, other players wanted to play with him. And so oh. he was able to install all of these great players around him, as well as TSM being willing to dump, you know, just having more money than everybody else. Because... Back in the day, that's what they had um, because of their popularity. But now a lot of other teams due to venture capital or, uh, you know, getting ma major sponsors, you know, being Team Liquid. I, I, I do want to get into a time machine and go back to last year. And I just wonder what would have happened if Jensen had stayed on that team instead of Bjergsen. I, like, truly, I, I do Yeah, wonder. for sure. I do wonder. And what if Bjergsen had gone to C9 instead or something like that? There, there, there are a lot of questions that... I would really like to know. Which, by the I, way, I, you know what, Monty? I've done a really good job these last years. What I've learned is this. It's not even that there's a real statute of limitations. It's that what you just learn is, it's like that famous saying, you know, like it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. What you yeah. learn, Monty, is just like you get the feel over time of when the statute of limitations is. Essentially, what you have to know is, will the person really care anymore? And if they don't, they don't. So, spoiler, I'll reveal it right now. I won't say any more details than this. I'll just give you this little gem. A bit like every now and then on Twitter, I do. So, like you alluded, to there that was behind the scenes if people don't know what was happening it was a bidding war between cloud nine and team liquid and if it wasn't team liquid Bjergsen would have been on cloud nine as far as i know that was the story right you heard something similar I, right yeah yeah i mean so I, that could, I, I that, think... that's like a real other timeline that could have happened yeah <laughs> I, I actually think that timeline would have been better for literally everybody involved probably so disappointing the joke is this monty this is the ultimate joke of all time that also would have been an absolute slam dunk for the fucking LS lineup. Like, oh, what's up, Bjergsen? You have to pay, like, support of champions. Man. Like, yeah, homie, I'm about <laughs> half a decade ahead of you. Like, that's what I do now. Exactly. The joke is it would have been, like, the most crazy, obvious slam dunk fit of all time, in it. I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, back to LCK. Back, here's back the, to the good teams. <laughs> here's the real question. Because obviously, like you say, the problem with KT is, like, they have elements that are good and interesting, but, like, realistically, that best is supposed to be a dark horse LCK. So the real question is this, Monty. What is the strength of team one? Because that's the real thing people want to know. Remember, this is the team that essentially, I think it's very bold, has no joke, looked at Worlds. And instead of, I have the opposite take, Monty. When I saw Worlds and that they didn't win, I was like, dude, if you're not going to win with like this set of teams and this support, like I have to do a move. They've said the opposite. They've said, they're, they're, doing, they're essentially, Monty, they're on this like 17 and Blackjack and they're like, hold, well, well, 16 on this one, you know, like, they're not ever going to go for it, even against like, the, the fucking the ace of dealer, you know, like on this one, you got to go for it, but they won't. So they're gambling that this is a good enough to win everything. So what do you think so far? I don't know if I necessarily agree with that analogy, just because uh, who would they replace? Owner? Right? It's so the like, problem, well, Monty. I do think some <laughs> players on T1 are overrated, which is why I think when they collapse, like it's not, it doesn't look at, but it's weird. When T1 collapses, it's not as crazy as when like Gen G does. When Gen G does, you are like looking at the roster, like, it just makes sense though. Like, rule is just <laughs> shit. And then this guy, when T1 collapses, like, I, I put it this way, Zeus in finals was whack. Obviously, I wouldn't replace him, but he, he has to figure that thing out. I do think Order's definitely like slightly overrated in this sense. He's good, but like put it this way: if you take him off T1 and we draft all the junglers in the world, how high is he going? You know what I mean? 
Would yeah, anyone be I taking think... him like third jungler in the world? I don't no. know about that. That's one more question. <laughs> I feel like for this team, he does no. a good job, but I feel like he's more questionable. Kumiyushi, obviously, look, it'd be a massive gamble, but there's that angle. The only ones he can't replace basically is Carrier and probably fake it for the logical reasons, you know? Yeah, and Zayas. I think I think you definitely run it back with Zayas. He's just too dominant. He was too dominant for a lot of the year. And and at MSI, he had a very good performance. Um, so I think with in Zayas's case, you have to forgive the finals, even though it is very hard to imagine a world where he can't step up and dumpster king in, in those finals. Uh, and even indeed, as we've discussed before, let him be finals MVP. Like you, that just can't happen. If you're Zayas, if you were the best top player in the world, that oh, is not a thing. I mean, if you think about it from a traditional sports perspective, you can't go into a championship match and allow the other player, your position to be MVP. Oh, if so. You are the best. Like, exactly. That's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's embarrassing. Um, so he was embarrassed. I think in those finals, even though he had a solid tournament overall, uh, as for well, the rest he is a of rookie, the rookie, as we always say, that one's more fun. Here's the thing I have to say, Monty, I understand from an orc perspective why they would probably never consider cutting Gumiyushi because one, there's the whole like innovation angle. But then secondly, there's the whole thing of like, they, they hope he's like faker of ADC and he's going to play there for eight years and get really amazing. But the problem I have to say is this, Monty, this was the off season when Viper and Ruler were available. And I'm sorry, if I could get either of those players, I'm taking it like that. <laughs> snap <laughs> instant. More deft. Well, that's not even a bad one either. <laughs> even marketing's pretty good on that angle, right? What, what, think how much fucking shit you could do with Death and Faker on the same team. Yeah, and I, I guess what's interesting about Gumiyushi too is that, so first off, you have to say, he actually massively improved at Worlds. Or oh, over very good Worlds, like, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, we didn't know which one it was going to be. Yes. As of right now, and as of watching the first couple of, of T1 matches, he is doing very well. Oh, so I'm well, hoping yeah. that he just like permanently leveled up at Worlds. But we have to remember that when he was bad was in the summer meta of, uh, uh, you know, of the of the summer split where it was a lot of Zeri and Sivir. He has not played Zeri yet, which was not one of his good champions, to be clear. He has played Sivir and he's he had a good game and kind of a bad game. Um, but these are champions that he has had a lot of time to practice, obviously in the off season, it can be difficult to improve your champion pool dramatically in the middle of a season, uh, when you're trying to catch up with the meta and you may not be able to fundamentally correct some aspects of your play. So, and he had never been to be clear. Well, first off, nobody had been in his area meta cause she was a new champion. And secondly, like there were changes made to Sivir and the Sivir meta hadn't been around for a very long time. So I think it's understandable that Gumiyushi may have some teething problems compared to other ADCs who have been around in previous metas of different champions where they kind of learned how to play them. So th this is all to say Gumiyushi's Lucian and Nami games, which have been the overwhelming number of T1 games so far, have been really on point. Well, I guess it's been two out of five. Um, and his Varus game that he played, also good, but we expected that from, from the World Championship. He was a very good Varus player. Uh, there. So I think I think T1, at least Gumiyushi, is looking better so far. Obviously, we need to keep an eye on that because the sample size is so small right now. But honestly, the real surprise has been Faker. Uh, Faker has looked extremely good. Um, and he did show glimmers, such as in the semifinal against JDG at Worlds. He was probably the best player on his team, had some amazing creative rise plays. But he wasn't very good in the finals. He wasn't terrible, but he wasn't great. And now he's coming back and he is making a lot of these huge, huge plays. I mean, his Lissandra game against Gen G was spectacular. And he was going up in lane against Trovi, who is an RE player with a 90% professional win rate on that champion. And Faker completely dominated that game. And he showed why Pays is a rookie player. I don't, I think Pays has actually performed very well, but he showed that, you know, he, he gave Pays a lesson. And I think I said this on the Monty and Wolf show, but I think what's fun about T1 is that you saw in that Genji game that they haven't lost that style that they had of like really long range pick. And you can see where they caught Pays out was Pays was thinking there's no way they're going to engage on me between these two, these yes. two turrets in mid lane. Little did he know. And there's no way he would know that because there were only two teams in the world. It was T1 and JDG last year who were going to be able to pull off moves like that from a screen away. And just like, you know, welcome to T1. Welcome to their style. You have to respect them in these situations. And and not every team's able to do what they can do in terms of pulling the trigger and catching you out. 
So I think I think T1, we we retain that core identity that has been so fun to watch from them. And Faker's performing at a high level. Gumisha continues to perform at a high level. And this team looks like one of the best two teams in LCK. But they also didn't make roster changes. So you can kind of, I think, expect that. Oh, well, I'm with you. Put it this way. Bear in mind, usually people don't do the fucking Faker check. They just look at T1 in the standings. And then if the number one go, wow, Faker is back. Like, the joke is Faker actually is back, as Monty just alluded to. You didn't even see this at Worlds, which he almost won. He was a game away from winning. Like, and then obviously the year before that, you go back to the couple of years back, there was the fucking one against Dan one. They could have been in the final. This actually did look amazing. I'm with you, mate. He actually looks like one of the absolute best Korean mid laners. Like, it's him and Showmaker, basically. They're, they're, yeah. they're the guys. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, to be fair... Which is also uh, amazing when you think what season he's in, mate. This is 2023. <laughs> we're in season 13, guys. This guy yeah, won be, season three, for fuck's sake. That's pretty good. Yeah, to be fair, um, he also is playing on a champion pool that's really comfort picks for him. It's, and it's I all his best that, champions. Rise fucking yeah, is here. Yeah, yeah. Everything he plays, of course, yeah. <laughs> Rise is here. I mean, he was, he's, but he's also playing fringe meta champions. Like, he's playing faker champions like Lissandra and Galio. Um He's he's playing Oriana. You know, the, the funny thing is the longer Faker's career goes, like the more he just becomes Xiao Hu, which is... Mental, isn't it? <laughs> well, the joke is, it, I don't know if people know this, but if you actually look, like obviously he even originally did that in like season seven against Xiao Hu. That was like the fucking run when he did. Because yeah, yeah. The, the back half of his career, this is actually a good contrast to what we were talking about earlier. Whereas like Bjergsen's back half of his career is mad underwhelming where he became like all the bad caricatures of what people say, like a frog and players, like, but without like the upside... Faker actually has that's one thing I do respect look to me I think like the first half of his career he was like the super dominant individual mega cap blah 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 blah, blah. all the rest what's amazing to me is he just became one of those players who just knows how to win the game and like help his team win the game and fill the spots and like you're saying because I agree I think he, he's way more modeled like or characterized like Xiao which I have mad respect for how he plays the game yeah but it also means that in the big championship moments some of his other teammates have to step oh, of up course. and carry yes. them to the title, right? Oh, it's very much the, more the like the LeBron mentality of like, yeah, the difference is he's not Michael Jordan taking the last shot. He's like finding the right player to win the game, as it were, whatever the fuck. Right, right. Like the coaches want everyone to believe you should do. But the problem <laughs> is we're all fans. So we're all like, no, just give it to the best player and get out of the way. Like everyone knows the, the problem with the fans, the allure. <laughs> But I, I think fans have been joking about the fifth age of Faker. And obviously, it's way too early to say that. And the meta is, I think, very favorable to him. But the eye test has has really done well. And the fact is, is that T1 came out of the gate with some hard opponents. Like, we can talk about how Genji has a new support player uh, that they're trying to train up from kind of a lesser s squad uh, with the lights. Or that they have this rookie player named Pays who... Honestly, has been very good in lane, but has been making kind of rookie macro mistakes, which is to be expected. And they played against KT Rolster, which is a roster of entire veterans that are trying to gel for the first time. But both of those teams are teams that we expect to be in the top four or five teams within this league by the end of spring. And especially KT has looked solid pretty immediately. So the fact that they came in one week and it was a hard week to take out two of what we ex anticipate will be other top teams in this league is a, is a statement from T1. It is. By the way, I want to ask well. you something. I forgot to ask you this on the episode where we did all the ranking. What do you actually think is the logic behind the scenes for why Gen G took their choices with their roster? Like, if you notice, bearing in mind, these aren't like the craziest rookies that everyone had to sign. And like, they're guaranteed. It's what's not like the ball guy from fucking LEC in Vitality. Like, do you, does this imply to you they just wanted to downsize for this year? Like, they sort of went for it last year, didn't work out. So they're like, right, more of a chill year this year or sort of re, like, like take it back a step. And then maybe next year you go up to the big roster again. What do you think? I mean, I think that, so we have to remember what, Genji is as a team. Genji is a very different style of team than the other big Korean rosters. And by that, I mean, if we think about T1, so T1 is partially now partially owned by SK Telecom and they're partially owned by Comcast. And so money really isn't an object for them because at the end of the day, this is a marketing exercise for SK Telecom and Comcast has infinity dollars. If we're talking about KT, again, it's a marketing exercise. It's a branding exercise for KT. So they can lose money as part of their marketing budgets and have it be a justifiable expense. When we talk about Gen G, Gen G is a team that was founded uh, in California. And so they are a more 
th- they are structured much more like a Western esports team that took on venture capital, right? And then is trying to support itself and make profit based off of sponsorship and, and other revenue generation. They are not a marketing loss leader in the way that some of the other right. Korean teams are, right? And that's a very big difference between the way Western teams are run and Eastern teams are run. And I think it's, if you guys have been following Arnold Hur, who's their CEO on Twitter, he has been saying, I mean, he's been ringing the, the warning bells for a while about LCK, saying that revenue in LCK was low and that they need to figure out ways to generate more revenue and viewership. And he's been publicly quite concerned. So I think it's a budget issue, if I had right. to guess, right? Like Ruler was going to be really expensive. Sure. And there's like a reason really he's in China right now, guys. There's a reason. <laughs> what a bang of team as well. So there's a reason. I imagine it costs a lot to resign, sure. Right. Um, and I think that they had confidence in Pays that he would be able to do well in this roster. And I think Pays has had a really solid debut. So is he ruler? No, but nobody expected him to be ruler. I- is he a player potentially that can grow into being a star like Gumiyushi has? Signs are good right now. And he has a bunch of veteran players and coaches around to help him. But as far as his start goes, it was better than I anticipated. And that's that's saying something. He has really big shoes to fill. Um, and the mistakes that he made, I mean, he's a beast in lane, first off. Like, his laning and mechanics are really good. And I think he'll learn quickly about some of the macro mistakes that he's made or being caught out or positioning errors. Um, I think he will adjust uh, adjust relatively quickly. So it's never going to be, he's never going to fill the ruler hole, as it will. Like, you just can't do that, you, you know, unless he magically becomes a top two player in his position in the world. But I do think for in Gen G's case, you can kind of put the, you, you know, you can read the tea leaves that have been put out there by the people within the organization and their actions and say, well, probably they don't want to spend a lot, especially if we're, I mean, Arnold, I think himself has referred to it as an esports winter on Twitter. And if you believe you're going into esports winter, which he appears to believe, then why would you splash out a bunch of money? Um, you know, he's got a good team. They are going to finish. You know, they're going to be a playoff team. It's not really Still a Still have a chance for Worlds to be like borderline. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Here's yeah, the thing, I, though. This brings up the obvious question that no one wants to have because it's an uncomfortable one. One thing people never want to ever do in esports, Monty, this is where I've noticed the sports angle ruins the entertainment angle. People never want to either like kill the momentum of a narrative or even worse, this is the cardinal sin when a narrative has to be rolled back. Because I'll tell you what right now, Monty, after watching the opening games, you know how in Windows, if it fucks up, you roll it back to the past version. Fucking Chovy's rolled it back, hasn't he? <laughs> it's just back. Everything that people didn't like about him all those years, he's just going to be like that. Like I know we've only seen a couple of series, but it just looks like it's going to be that again, guys. Because the biggest problem I've always had with Chovy, I'll probably do like a solo video on this, is I do think at things like farming, he actually genuinely is a genius. Like I think it's like he's done he's, he's done some things in that regard so many years in the game that they almost shouldn't even be possible. Like those stats you used to read out last year of like how many C like like plus ten CS like every game. Or whatever that's impossible in lck so there are some things he's incredible on it he's somebody who's absolutely by the way worthy of like a documentary or something but the problem is man alive to this guy's flaws just kill his game like the difference (laughs) is the joke is this right i'm not exaggerating that obviously we're talking relative to their regions but like i actually sort of low-key hate players like trophy for this reason because any advantage they get they don't really use it to win the game still they still play like a little bit too selfishly and a bit stubbornly whereas like as much as I might I might think that certain players are coin flippy in the West. Dude, at least people like Jazuki just sort of like go for it. Like they just try and win the game, you know. Like whether they, they might fuck up the whole game and into it and die a couple of times, but they'll go for it, you know. Like they're, just, they're not gonna just fucking like chill out like well. Because the problem with Chovy is you almost do get the sense. I've never spoken to him, obviously he's Korean, but I almost get the sense he is like old school frog and where if you were to message him afterwards, like well, rough game, he'd be like, What do you mean? I was up 18 CS at minute eight. Like, oh <laughs> bloody hell. who cares about that, man? Only you care about that, you know. We've got to have this discussion like Chovy he's, he's not unfortunately even though his skill level is incredible he's not a 1v9 player is he he's just not that guy I think he I think he really regressed hard during Worlds and he became 
old Chovy. He he reverse evolved. I don't know what the previous form of Chovy was as a Pokemon. If it was Chover or wh- whatever you want to call it. Well, it was. He re- ready. Listen, the previous form because it starts as just Chovy, right? Griffin Chovy is where it starts as. Then the second form, which is really good, it's it's best skill, but only skill is farming, and then it has a secondary skill, side lane, right? Are you ready? This is the problem, Monty. That second form is called Choverated. Right, and then the third one is like whatever you can go one and Chovy or something. Overlord. Then and then the ultimate evolution that you reached last year was the one and Chovy. Right, that's like the top third level evolution. Whatever, Choverated. Chov- what was it you said? Chovelord or something? Choverlord. There you go, Choverlord. One of those two. From 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 Choki to Choverated. Is that what's sad, dude? Like, this is the guy where it's like, I, I, he, I feel like this is a classic example of the guy that is a nightmare if you do these shows. Because he's either absurdly overrated. Look, he wasn't actually last year, by the way. Last year was where he caught up to the narrative. But he is either absurdly overrated or people just act like he's shit. And it's like, it's it's neither. He's It's just, he's a really tricky player to define, you know? I, I think that's what's, what's tough about him. Uh, he Look, he had a really good series against DRX. I'm not ready to oh, no, sure. kind of say that he has regressed. There were clearly a lot of team problems that were happening within Gen G at Worlds last year. They never really figured out the meta. They never really figured out how they wanted to play as a team in it. And I think in the absence of that direction, that's where he reverted back to his old style because no one was providing any structure for how they wanted to view and play the game. And so he autopiloted it. Oh, um, by the way, here's the other thing to throw in as well. Because here's the downside to being a god of farming. Mate, if he's ever behind, you just give up. You know what I mean? Like that fake series you're talking about. As soon as you see he's behind, you're just like, well, in that case, we're doing another win condition, don't we? Like, what, what are we doing? He's he's just gonna gracefully lose. You know? I, I think in the T1 series, I, Peanut was terrible in that first game, and then they just got hard stomped the second game across all of their lanes. Uh I I think you you do need to give them a little bit of time to stabilize with this new roster. Again, they looked very good versus DRX, but DRX may be the new Nongshim, which is a bunch of veteran players who are somehow less than the sum of their parts because they have looked super terrible uh, so far. But he completely dominated that series and, uh, you know, pays and delight. Also, neither of them even died in two games versus DRX, which is impressive for a new bot lane and for a rookie ADC. Uh, I think I think Gen G should be able to bounce back and at least next time they face T1, give them more of a run for their money. Uh, they had they had a they had a real chance to win that that first game of the series. Sure. But yeah, I think uh, to your point, I think that Chovy at some point he has to be the star player and as you say the 1v9 hard carry on this roster and it's down to him at this point in time with pays there and ruler gone and he just i agree he seems like a player who just can't step up in those situations so play for kda uh when the going gets tough instead of actually trying to push the limit and make a win out of nothing Basically, my fear is as the split goes on, logically, unfortunately, with the bot lane he has, I expect they're going to have times when they struggle or they're not doing very well. And like, <laughs> if I did, as you say, the joke was, it felt like last year's Gen G was some sort of fucked up scenario, Monty, where you try and like, you do what I say, you try and cover everyone's flaws using someone else's strength. And so like at the end, before Worlds, it's like we just convinced ourselves there was no flaws. Like actually Peanuts, <laughs> he never chokes. Now, what do you talk about? Chovy, he uses that farm to smash the game. And then Ruler, he's the ADC. So they farmed up and then he's ready for the fight. It's like we we convinced ourselves they'd like completed it. But the problem was, it's like the cracks started to show, you know, I would like a movie whenever they're out on the ice. It doesn't just instantly open up. It's not, you just hear that sound, don't you? Like, <laughs> and then, like, obviously, the semifinals were just all thing fucking just collapsing in and just being wrecked. So I'm just concerned. Like, you're right. It's only a couple of series now, but I'm concerned what happens in, like, four series when they've, like, gone one and three in the last one. That's I where mean, he's just going to, like, the CS totals all he's playing for. Then, mate. It's all what, he's what, playing for. Uh, what, what's our expectation here, if we're being realistic? Like, fourth, fifth place for Gen G? You know what I mean? Like... This is there's there's a strong field within LCK this year, and 
maybe you know maybe they can take but, but third. No, the but... table got way stronger than it felt like it was in some of the last years. Like there's a lot oh, of dangerous yeah. teams now. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think what's what's interesting too is that even some of the bottom teams, such as Guangdong Freaks and Nongshim Red Force, have basically gone with majority rookie rosters, and Guangdong Freaks looked pretty good for a team full of rookies at the start of a split. They may be 0-2, but they were fighting, and they, frankly, they seem a lot hungrier than some of the mid-table teams. They seem a lot hungrier than DRX or Hanwha Life do, for example. And as we know, you know, there have been a lot of good players coming up in Korea if you give them those opportunities. So I think that's a team that isn't going to be great right now, but I think at least shows a lot of fire and could be good in, in four or five months' time. I've got a question. I normally never ask this because on this show we do what we want. We do everything colloquially, don't we? But since you do that show with Wolf, the Monty and Wolf show, I didn't come up with that name, by the way. My name's Roll Straight Fire, but whatever. It works, obviously. <laughs> it is by definition utilitarian as a fucking name. So when he does, when you do that show, Monty and Wolf, I notice Wolf. This is how you know he has lived in Korea a long time and it's like shaped his brain because he does that mega polite thing where I notice he always does refer to these orgs as whatever ridiculous name sponsor change they've done. So he really did every <laughs> single time ever say damn one key you like because he's just a g <laughs> like that like it's how you know he's been on broadcast so long whereas i don't care like to me i'd say like damn one like till the end of time so t- uh, here's my question what should are we going to call them d plus or do we call yes, them we have, so, so first off so first off it's not like <laughs> dom one was a good name like let's it wasn't at all clear. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> We're, it, people look this rebranding is fucking terrible but it we didn't lose anything in the rebranding (laughs) we just traded one shit for a different kind of shit that's probably a little bit worse but it's not worse necessarily actually it is worse because of the name but it's also worse because of the color changes they lost the teal that was the black and teal and gray was that was a color scheme now there's just this concrete gray it's like they intentionally picked the worst possible color combination and branding that you could come up with like who designed this garbage between Dam One D Plus this year and that Gen G one we all made fun of with the little kids <laughs> fucking cartoon crayon tiger from like Kit Fisher Price or whatever. What is going on with the aesthetics? Because if people don't know, this is one thing I'll never stand for, Monty. If people don't know, if you go back to the 2000s, you know this. There was an era when they had they were like ahead of the game. They were the ones that had the futuristic looking shit. It looked fucking some of them looked really slick, those designs for the early shirts. Like you remember, dude, back in the day, what the old like when people like Bisu were there, like what the team one jersey used to look like on the KT. They used to look sure. baggers. The Hwasun Rose one with Jadong. Some of these used to look <laughs> fucking sick though. Whereas like, I agree, mate. You look at them now. These shirts just look like what, like the, I, here's my analogy. This is going to hurt people's feelings. All the top <laughs> Korean jerseys now just look like what the worst LEC jersey would look like. Just a shit football jersey you know, from like a, some average European league, you know, just like, oh, it's a logo here, big one here. Like, what's, where's the creativity? Well, I almost made a mistake there. I've just realized Gen G's like, wait, creativity again? Not you. Not you. You've had <laughs> hey, your chance at that. They're good. They're new they're, I like the new they are Gen pretty G good, actually, now. They're pretty good. <laughs> Speaking they, of which, though, so, I'll tell you what, though. That's an area where Korea is behind. Because I'll tell you what, I still think the LPL has really good graphic design in general. They have some banger logos, like design. I, I even think some of their color schemes are really classical. Like, I love that one that RNG has, like the black and gold. Like I think they've got some really cool, iconic ones. The IG logo is super iconic. They've got yep. some classic ones in China, yeah. I like the new Vitality jerseys. I think those pretty are cool. pretty cool. They're pretty yeah. good. All right. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think this D-plus is, I mean, obviously, it's just tragic. It seems also, like let's ra- think about the branding. If you're going to be absolutely the best Korean team, what's your name? D-plus. That sounds like your shit. By definition, D-plus is like you just passed. Think about <laughs> it. The whole system doesn't work. <laughs> You could have called yourselves S plus. I'm yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be sick, even, wouldn't it? Like, how, by the way, has no one ever just made a team called like S class or S tier or something in Korea? Like, seems obvious to me. It's a slam dunk, and it? it's the best name. Uh, well, Wolf Wolf said that apparently they wanted to honor the legacy of Damwon, so they're like the new version of Damwon. So it's like D plus is the the new era. And then they took the old Damwon logo. It just logo, sounds like, like a whack penis extension really, they, fucking <laughs> operation or something, doesn't it? Come on, man. Or oh, some like uh, awesome fucking consumer product. Like, are you having problems getting it up for worlds? Get the new D plus. Like, you know, no teal involved now. Exactly. Like, no, just like just extender or something. You know, <laughs> it's just a penis pump for Austin Powers or something. I don't know. Bring it up, Adanian. Bring it up when I say it. There you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god! I mean, yeah, it's. Oh, I guess it's, it is appropriate, Monty, because spoiler: this team is absolutely going to slap every every other team in the LCK round with their monster dong because this team is fucking. <laughs> this team is going to run the table, bit completely. Yeah, it's it's a really good team. They've been super super dominant, but we do have to we do have to consider that their opponents were DRX and Liz sure. and so I'm, I'm, I'm holding I'm holding out here. T1 certainly had a harder schedule to kick things off. But also, I mean, there are certain facts that we that are just undeniable. I, I brought this up on the Monty and Wolf show. Kellen, Kellen hasn't died. <laughs> like, you know, we we could have criticized the the Kellen and Duck Dom lane as perhaps being one of the weaker parts yep. of the team last year. Uh, but so far, Kellen has yet to have a single death. And not only that, but he is averaging 16 and a half assists a game. He has a 95% kill contribution rate. And it's not like they're getting eight kills a game. They're getting like 20 kills a game. So this guy is absolutely popping off with Deft in this roster. Kana seems like the more stable weak side player because the, the truth of the truth of Nuggery is we were all excited for him to come back, but he's done. I mean, he was he was close. Uh, for whatever reason, really, yeah, he was still he was still burnt out very clearly. He never really got back to that level of play. And Kana is a weak side player that can absolutely fill the role that's needed on this team to play around Canyon and Deft. And they are playing through bot lane right now, very clearly. That is their game plan. You know, they want to run the Lucian Nami lanes. They want to dominate, and they want to have Deft carry. And this team is absolutely clapping. And you can't. Even though their strength of schedule hasn't been strong, you cannot ask more of them than we've seen already because they have died 12 times in four games total. Like you can't smack people around harder than they've smacked their opponents around. So they've delivered and then some. And that's why this next week is going to be so exciting because we're going to watch them play T1 and then we're going to have some real answers to these questions. Yes. Yeah, by the way, I, I'm with you as well on the Kellen angle. It actually looks low-key like he might have been gated by that old bot lane. Because obviously the problem people always have is it's like jungle and mid and fucking ADC and support. Because logically, think about it, guys. Like, for bot lane, you pick your fucking champions in coordination. You don't just pick your champion because you're amazing at it. Like, if you're a support, you know, depending on what the philosophy around your ADC picking, you might only have like two choices every game or something, you know? Like, you don't just play wherever you want. Yeah, and I think Doc Dom is a good player, he's but like, I think he... I thought he, was, he showed more than you expect on that one. Yeah, and but he, at the end of the day, is not the star ADC. And oh, of course he, not. he is somewhat gated by meta. Obviously, we know he's an incredible Aphelios player, but he was never super good in the summer, like, Zeri Sivir meta. And uh, he still doesn't look good, although part of that I think laning with Beryl is difficult because Beryl is hardly a mechanical god within the laning phase. So he, you know, he's stuck in a lane with a player who's mechanically far worse than him. And I think he's going to have to kind of change his style of play in order to accommodate that. But as of right now, like, I, th I think DRX is going to be completely dysfunctional. I have questions about how functional Hanwha life is going to be as a roster, uh, especially having shame, watched... It did look interested on paper, didn't it? Yeah, yeah but their first games have been pretty bad. And I think D plus it's, it's hard to see who's going to stop this team. Like T one is, you know, this is going to be an epic battle this year, most likely between T one and D plus, and they may trade titles. It may depend on the meta a little bit, but these, these is going to be a really, really fun rivalry to watch because it's, it's almost too perfect. Like how could you have deft, Win, beat Faker at Worlds, then go to the rival team to join up with the super team that previously had beaten Faker a bunch in years with Showmaker and Canyon. Then you have Kana, who got kicked off of T1 for Zayas, and then you got that, that rivalry building up. I, it's just, it's too fucking good, man. I, I couldn't write it better. <laughs> I couldn't yes. write it better. It's it's wonderful. Also, by the way, it, the key thing is, if you are a Hanwha Life believer, this next week will either make or break your faith. Because since they play against KT and Gen G, yep. this is perfect. Monty is the litmus test. If they yes. can't beat these are two they teams, the they, are not, team? they are not going to be a relevant team. If they can <laughs> beat both these teams, they're back in the mix. Perfect. Yeah. 
Yeah, if Hanwha beats both of those teams, then I think we say, oh, okay, this probably is the third best team within the league. Yes. I think it's going to be very difficult for the, them to win both of those best of threes, especially since they only have one day off between them. Uh, it's it's a hard week. But Hanwha has really under-delivered. And, and to be fair, this team feels like you spent a lot of money and probably are not going to get uh, the best bang for your buck. Obviously, King and Nzeka are were coming off demanding pretty significant contracts. I just like the way he still just plays Silas and Akali every game. He's good at it. I don't uh, know, but it's so ridiculous. Though, isn't it? Like, these cunts have a tripod in this show. Just make a play <laughs> somewhere else. What is it? I don't know. They, they, got, they got other problems, and they got other things to ban. But uh, the the... The Zeka has been a bright spot for this roster. Viper has been pretty underwhelming so far. Life has been up and down. Clit has been terrible for the most part. And Kingen has been okay. But the thing is, you Hanwa is paying top dollar for Kingen, Zeka, and Viper. And these players need to actually step up. I mean, I will say it. I, 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 would, I would like to introduce um, this squad to a certain concept, it goes like this. You don't want to buy things at the top of their value exactly, and then watch exactly. them depreciate. So I'm just saying, like, <laughs> you deserve that for buying Kingen when he wasn't the player of one world. So <laughs> you missed that one, you idiot. He's never going to do it again, is he? Like, come on. Kingen was Bitcoin at $40,000. Exactly. That's yes. what they got in. They're like, oh, this crypto market looks great. <laughs> Time to all in right now. I, I think this is actually a very, very badly constructed roster. Yeah. And whether Clid is even going to last this season is a big question. Now, I don't but think my fear about that player because I've always thought his rep has been so open. If you if he was a stock graph dude, the Clid one's crazy because it's like this, isn't it? But here's the problem: if you look at his style of play, it makes perfect sense, mate. I've always worried about him. Anytime someone starts their career as like mechanical leasing player, like Jesus, get the coin ready, get the eternal coin ready for their whole career because if when you're mechanical are there, you're going to look fucking sick. When they're not, you're going to look whack, aren't you? That's just the way your career's going to go. And he, and, and that was years ago, this guy was a stud. Like, think of, dude, it was in season nine, he was on SKT. He was playing with, like, Doinby, like, half a decade ago now. Like, fucking <laughs> hell, guys. He's pretty, he's pretty long in the tooth now, Clint. Well, and some of the players like Keen and BDD were coming off down seasons, and so was Clint. I mean, Clint was not no. good uh, on FBX. And Maybe you think that, oh, well, coming back to Korea, getting into this roster with a couple, you know, actually three former world champions now that Viper's on the roster as well, maybe this will reinvigorate him. And I, I, I do think that Clint has been bad, but I also think that his he he has been unfairly pinned as a, a bigger problem. He's a problem, but he's not a, he's not the problem that the fans seem to think that he is. He has actually been very good at securing objectives for this team. So they want the him caught. Is, the fans want him caught already. Oh, already. Yeah, yeah. Because they want Dread. They want Dread. Because Dread, Dread doesn't have a team right now, and Dread is probably better than him. He's a good player, but I'm not alive. Come on. <laughs> but, you know, all, all, as I was saying, this, this whole team, like, obviously needs more time to gel. But Clid has been really good at objective control for the most part so far, and that is valuable. And I think people are understating the things that Clid has been doing well because it's so easy admittedly to focus on the fact that Willer can just walk into his jungle and 1v1 kill him at level 3 which is not something that should be happening especially when he knows where Willer is and then they lose to live sandbox I mean, it's embarrassing it's embarrassing um they shouldn't be I mean they shouldn't be losing to a live sandbox roster that consists of fucking Birdall, Willer, Closer, Envy, and Kyel. And Envy is coming off of a game where he was just curb stomped. Oh, man, that. That, like, that D plus series oh was fucking God. hilarious. <laughs> what it had all. Like, the joke is, like, if you're sandbox after that, like... That, like, you'll, that you'll be experienced trauma from that game. Like it was Vietnam or something, mate. It was mental, wasn't it? <laughs> like, Envy, Envy had one of the worst performances yes. from a professional ADC that I have seen in some time in that series. And for him to, for for him to bounce back and then beat Viper is, the, I mean, it's it's like one of those things that's just unacceptable. If you're Viper in life, my God, you can't lose to Envy like that after he was just, you know, choke slammed by death. Um, 
Also, yeah. how's Deft also popping off? Think it's twenty twenty three, guys. Like, <laughs> I, I'll just put. A, I'll just put. Fountain of youth. <laughs> let me just give you a piece of context if you're a fan out there. Because remember, dude, in my game CS:GO, what we always had over you guys in other games was longevity. Because obviously, like the career situation isn't as killer. Like if you just show you're good as a player, the game's more static. Dude, think about this logically. When Deft came up, right, the year that he won at LCK OGN was in twenty fourteen. Right. In 2014, the best CS Go player was Get Right. Do people understand that? Like, he hasn't even been a player for about four years. Like, he, he's he retired years ago. Def still fucking rocking LCK in 2023. It's impossible. Him and Faker oh. are just aliens, mate. They are. They're just aliens. It's impossible. <laughs> are, but here's, here, I have a new theory. I have a new theory. You may know that there was, a, there was an early Spanish explorer in the Americas named Ponce de Leon, right? And he famously was exploring Florida and allegedly found the fountain of youth in Florida. So now that Worlds was in North America, the leading theory has to be that Deft and Faker found the fountain of youth in Florida that Ponce de Leon discovered. There you go. I've tied it all together. It refreshed them. Obviously, in this scenario, they only found it after Worlds, though. That was what uh, really exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had a, they had a break after after exactly. the, the finals in San Francisco. Took 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 a trip to Florida. There you go. Yes. Either that, no. or they basically did get together and say, "Look, we're, we're not going to play together like we always said we would." But I'll tell you what. Let's break out the old tech, the really old Dark Lord. <laughs> and what they got is they got out the old skill vampire set and they said, oh, look, look, and they poor bastards. Zekka and a fucking Viper just went in the toilets. Let's get him now. They went in, <laughs> took it, came back out, one little drip of blood. Hmm, oh, I got that. Anyway, see you see in the finals, mate. See you. I'll see you in the LCK finals. Because, mate, they've just drained these guys. What the fuck? <laughs> well, that, that makes sense. They, they know how to avoid the skill vampires exactly. in North America. Zekka and King they must be the only ones. They haven't been here before. Exactly. <laughs> the skill vampires from America got them. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, look, I think Hamwell Life, I hope they can get it together because, frankly, LCK is a much more exciting league if be. these guys, yes. you know, We need them. We're actually good. doing it. The problem with them, if you look at their roster, is I actually think theirs is one of the rosters you need at a minimum to be like a gatekeeper, if not actually a real contender, like you say. But the start, starting off, the, the hype around Viper, the hopefully, you know, the continuing hype around Zeka and King in coming off the World Finals, and for them to face off against, you know, the the Kwangdong freaks, which by the way, the Kwangdong freaks gave them a run for their money in spite of it being a two zero, and then to lose to Live Sandbox. I mean, you have to put these guys in the dumpster if you're Hanma Life. If you're if there's this much money on this roster, I'm hoping it was an off week, but. I think we're going to see some rough games from Hanwha Life ahead, unfortunately. Yeah, the other problem, I think, as well as a team that they're going to have is, like, Koreans... This is why Sandbox last year was so unusual, dude. It's so rare Koreans will ever run a team completely through your ADC. That is, like, going to be, the like, the least tried style ever in LCK. So, like, Sandbox might give you a false up, but they're not going to do that. So Viper's just going to have to get his shit together. He's not going to get <laughs> funneled, mate. That ain't going to happen. Well, right now, Deft is getting funneled. And I would argue that the global meta of League of Legends is funneling AD oh, carries right ADC now. for sure, yeah. Yeah, it's it feels like, uh, you know, a lot of AD carries pop popping off. And even if it's not the AD carry popping off, so many teams are playing through the bot lane right now. Um, I think this is a kind of a natural progression of both a lot of, you know, more focusing in terms of balance around the AD carry position. Hyper carry AD carries obviously being in the meta helps. Uh, but also it's a long-term knock-on effect of the TP changes to top lane, which made it, you know, it, you can, you can, it makes you have to pay attention to bot lane in many ways, especially as a jungler and a mid, because the wave state and the pressure are so important because it dictates dives that you, it's harder to counteract now. Um, you know, it's, it's, and also the dragon control is very important these days. Uh, we, we have seen a pretty high priority on dragon from a lot of the top teams. And that is all resulting in, you know, a very bot lane focused meta at the moment. Also because we have supportive junglers for the most part. So you're not getting necessarily the same carry punch. And, you know, uh, based on the changes that we've seen to the next patch of play with Quick Blades and Infinity Edge going down to uh, having their passives uh, activated by 40% crit, that's going to be really interesting because we're going to see a lot of two item power spike AD carry, both AD carries and plays around that two item power spike, which 
you know, hope you like Caitlin and uh, and Lucian guys because <laughs> those are those are probably going to be even higher priority right now. By the way, one thing because we just never ever talked about it on this show is what do you think about Cassante then? Because I thought this would be an interesting oh, region yeah. to ask about because obviously that's like being a very pretty picked champion. I really like him as a champion. Um, I think he's really well designed. Uh, he's over tuned right now in the way very that strong it looks like. Yeah, yeah, he's he's very strong, but uh, his kit will make him strong. I think pretty much regardless. But he has a lot of interesting interactions in terms of how you can play over terrain with him by using his ultimate. Um, I, I think he pre presents a lot of outplay potential because as Riot does, you know, now we have the dashes and every Q ability has like three different Qs associated with it where they're going to do different things. So he's he's highly complicated, but his skill ceiling, I think, is really is really good. Um, I, I think a lot of people are probably annoyed with him because he probably does too much damage at the moment. Like he provides a lot of utility as it is. And I don't think his damage has to be as high. So he is over present, but I think from a fundamental kit perspective, he's good. And this is a, this is his level of mobility is different because when we think about champions that are good at the professional scene, one of the reasons why I hate Zeri and I hate Yumi is because in any, I've said this many times, but in any professional game, in any professional esport, doesn't matter what genre it is, could be FPS, could be MOBA, could be RTS, move speed is always going to be the most OP stat uh, at a professional level because the pros can, they simply have better mechanics, they can react as a team faster, it is broken. Um, and so when you think about the professional scene, you have to be very careful about how you give move speed and especially how you give move speed on cleanup and like snowball mechanic move speed, which is what champions like Jinx and Zeri have. Um, and those, those, it has to be really tempered because good professional teams will be able to use that move speed to kind of clean up or, or persist a fight. And that was the issue last year with Zeri was that once you started winning, you just couldn't, you could be stopped from winning basically. And Yumi also, giving insane move speed for cleanup and being untargetable and annoying is a major factor in that. So this is all to say that Kesante doesn't have those super annoying things. Like, yeah, he has dashes. Yeah, he can he can take you over a wall and change your positioning. But there is counterplay to that. Like, don't stand by the walls, for example. Um, that makes team fighting interesting to me. So I think he's too strong, but I think that he does have a cool place in the meta. He's fun to watch lane. He's fun to watch as a champion. And I think once they dial him back a little bit, that he will be in a good place. Yeah, on that, I would just say this. One area I do think is very unfair about how we judge things when we're in esports, for example, is when something is brand new released. Like, as you say, Monty, it's just the riot way. It will always have, like, stats overtuned because that's just the way they introduce the champion to the world yes. and get everyone to play it or think you have to buy it or have the counters for it, blah, blah, blah. We all know that. Like, we're never going to change their mind on that one. But the bigger one to me is this. People will always spend, like, a few months extra. It's like the, the whining, like, lags behind. As, as you said, at the end there as like competitively people learn how to use the champion because I've always thought the most whack area of League of Legends in, in terms of like the coaching angle is because since you know in League of Legends there are no timeouts it's not like the NFL or Counter Strike you can't like pause and go like right we need to switch up guys we're doing it wrong here essentially when you coach the team you have to just it's you're essentially like the deist god you just set everything up before it starts press the button and then walk away and you can't affect anything you have to just hope that your creations were correctly programmed by you to do what you want so I've always thought the ultimate area in league that people blame the champions not the players which I think is totally wrong Monty is like you're talking about is ones that have niche angles like the obvious one in the last few years to me would be like if you want to go last year how about Poppy Mate, the number of pro players where it's like, dude, that wasn't the champion that was OP. You just fucking stood where it was obvious where you were going to get hit. Or like you were like right next to a wall, for example, like you just stuck in a choke as the most obvious damage fucking target. Like in that scenario, that's just bad play or bad coach. And that isn't the champion that's broken. You know what I mean? Like same with like, we were making so much fun, if people don't remember last year, of all those ADCs in fucking NA playing Seraphine because it's like, bro, the idea you can like auto pick this and win just says your whole league is terrible coaching like you just don't understand how the champion works like everyone's walked in a fucking hole every time like that that's a, that's one area I do think that people take like look we all like to complain when something is overtuned like stats wise I agree fucking get it out but it's not like it's not that the kit's just 
this is unfair. Like that thing, I, I agree with you, Monty. That kit looks like it had some interesting dynamics. I thought yeah, it looked quite look, good. And people will complain about having a lot of dashes, but like Lee Sin's been around forever. And Lee Sin is one of the best design champions in the game of League of he Legends is. because he allows it. the best, you yep. know, the most outplay potential and skill expression. And basically every meta is always better for having Lee Sin at least be an option. Like go back and watch Canyon play Lee Sin this last week and tell me it wasn't fucking fun. It was. So I think there are good champion designs um, that that really can do a lot. And like, I like the fact that there is a risk to Kesante ulting and losing a bunch of his maximum HP. Like it, there, there are clear trade-offs within his kit that you just don't see with other champions that have been designed. Like, like I, I'm not sure what the trade-off is with Zeri. Like she's just garbage. Like she needs to, she needs to go away. Like I don't like Aphilios, you know, famously very much either because I think he's confusing. Everybody hates Yumi for obvious reasons. Um, it was not a. It's unfortunately Yumi's in a place where. Because of the kit, she's so good at the professional level that you have to nerf her to a degree that she would be basically unplayable for the general player base. Oh, that reminds the me. Problem. Yes, There's, that's another thing I want to tag on. So that's a perfect segue, Monty. Two things. One, we actually nailed this years ago. Do you remember a few years ago? I had a joke. And it wasn't about Yumi, though, I don't think. It might have been when Yumi was launched, to be fair. But it was about champions that don't have enough actual, like, I think I, I think I said it was like for me, like TF or something. Basically, if you remember, one of the problems you have in the modern day is that when a champion is really strong, this is why Yumi is the perfect example of this the problem is what you want to do in esports games i've found is it's a total myth that things can't be op they can be op but there has to be like an appropriate like scaling skill cost so the idea is to make it truly op this is why lee sin's a great example lee sin sometimes ls is sometimes right there's been times when it wasn't the best meta jungler but just the best oh, yeah. jungler in the world might be able to win on lee sin because of how insane the kit is like you say like specifically what it lets you do well along these lines the problem with yumi is just what everyone makes fun of it's not that it's too strong it's that you don't do anything while it's too strong that's what sucks <laughs> it feels like there's no counterplay so even though i said it as a joke years ago i actually do for real think they should add this element to the game you remember i told you back in the day they should almost have an element where it's like almost like those fucking rhythm games like you have to do a sequence or something because there needs to be more skill to to unlock that kit like the kits yeah. if you actually had to have skill to do that i wouldn't go longer you stay you attached know. the faster the whatever rhythm. it might be yeah some, <laughs> something like that here's the thing people would laugh now monty but i'll tell you right now when someone got really good at this you'd immediately see that it was like worthwhile as soon as you got so that this is what we'd all want right that the player who sucks who picks yumi can't do anything in the game but the player that's godlike who picks it does all that, that's what you want the problem we all have is when the guy who sucks picks it but some yumi meta and he sort of half wins the game without doing anything that's what we all hate isn't it <laughs> yeah and and the fact that it's untargetable and the fact that it gives move speed to people which is you know egregious like we, does it does a collie need more move speed <laughs> is that what a collie needs <laughs> you know, I, oh, oh let's be real it does violate every cardinal sin like as you say the most OP piece that is move speed give move speed to a, a, a thing then secondly untargetable already that's like pure to, i know it's like it's the tilt factor is insane all that shit. it's true that is true <laughs> No, it's uh, but anyway, I think Cassante is not super egregious. It's no, no, point. it's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> right, should we switch to LEC now? Uh, sure. Anything left on LCK? Uh, let me let me take a quick look. <laughs> I think um, we talked about everyone relevant. Uh, yeah, I mean, people will be like, "Oh, Breon's doing really well." Good Let's wait. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait until they beat more than Nongshim and the Kwangdong Freaks. Uh, yeah, we touched on touched on DRX being super disappointing. I mean, they're. The 0 and 4 record they have. I mean, granted, they played against D plus and and um, Gen G, so tough. tough here's, here's here's an angle no one's going to expect for LEC Monty. So I'll set it up for you. Here's the angle no one's thought of. You know, normally, you know, I love to complain about this. I I'm one of the people who hates best of one the most in esports. So normally, I always complain about like I hate how like narratives are like too strong for a B or one result. Also, classically in the old splits, you'll be on like week two and people act like the season's over. They've lost already. If they can't get that Baron, how can they ever? It's like blow, raw. You're like five games in. 
That is actually, are you ready, guys? Now justified, because remember, the round robin portion is a single round robin. It is only three weeks long, and so we have already played one third of the first phase of the tournament, guys. Yep. So even though, yes, it might seem silly, in a mad way, we actually are now justified, and we should actually be very strong with our takes. Because, for example, like the best examples would be like Vitality and fucking, no, not Vitality, XL and Fnatic, obviously, are in a bit of a tough spot after the first week, right? This isn't the old splits where they have ages to get it together and weeks and weeks and weeks of scrims and remember in the old splits you don't even have to figure it out yourself some folk are like misfits in the middle of the table might figure it out for you then you just go oh thank you and like that example you were talking about with fucking the KT, KT team last year you just go I will t- I, I, you made this I made this and then you just do the same <laughs> thing better like Vitaly tried to do to misfits but the problem is if you look now dude these first weeks are enormous People are, I feel like the joke is people are on the old schedule. These weeks are huge. Like, luckily, remember, the first phase is created so that not many teams get eliminated. So if you are the XLs of the world, you assume you'll get it together. But, like, you can't be doing that thing I said before. Like, XL has lost a lot of games, dude. Fnatic is in a rough spot. Like, these these aren't just like, ah, wait for next week. Next week, we'll be two-thirds of the way through the first phase, guys. Like, we've got we right. to keep track of this. I, I mean, to, to be fair to Fnatic... Um, well, they had all the best teams to play, to be fair to them. It, I'll, like, I'll give them that contract. They didn't look great, they, but the same. They also should have won that Vitality game. Oh, they should. <laughs> that was a throw and a half. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, they, 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 did have, they did have opportunities. But, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think you're right. It is actually hugely important. And because they're basically playing Super Weeks every week now, yep. they've changed it. So, you know, you really have to have a strong sense of your own team style because you're not going to have the same level of preparation for each of your individual opponents. So it really is about playing your game in the first week of, you know, three weeks of play, which again, look, we've praised this format. Okay. And the format is a lot better and it is a lot more exciting. But again, why you have to criticize this is because as much of an improvement as it is, you're still testing for two different things. You're testing Who is good in a rapid succession best of ones against the field? Whereas in the next phase of the tournament, you're prepping for a single opponent at a time in a best of three. And then in the playoffs, you're you're, you're doing the same thing and you're playing double elimination brackets, best of three. So is it my ideal format? No, but I also understand why they had to do this. And because they're only eliminating two teams, it's not super punishing. And you can always like bounce back in the next two phases. Like if you're a team that's maybe just not good at playing three best of ones a week, as long as you you're, you should be good enough to survive the top eight if you're capable of winning the whole yes. tournament. I think we can agree yes. on that. That's like the a key, reasonable thing. The key thing is essentially doing the LCS move where you just make all the teams make the next fit. Actually, for this one, makes sense, like you're saying. Because as you say, here's the difference. If XL can finish fucking ninth in this p- p- phase, I'm not really that hyped about what they might have done in the next phase sure. anyway. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think it's fine. Right, and because the next phase is also super forgiving because they have double elimination in the GSL groups and then they have double elimination of the top four teams for the final weekend of competition, I do think that it makes... This isn't super egregious is what I'm saying. Like, if you can't figure it out in nine best of ones to make top eight of the league, get fucked. (laughs) Get fucked. Um, So there is... It's not my favorite system. I still wouldn't do it this way, but it's okay. It's okay. It's not... It doesn't make me very angry. Uh, And I am very excited once we get beyond the first few weeks of competition. I will say that one of the potential pitfalls of this format is just the patch cycle because they are, this league is now so different from everybody else that the patch cycle is going to be based around the the boring leagues formats that we have in LCS, LCK, and LPL. And that means that they're not going to switch the patch super quickly. And as far as I know, they're not going to introduce 13.2 until they get to the actual playoffs. So it'll be after the GSL group stage before it'll be right before the top four, which means that the top four is going to be on a different patch. You know, it's not perfect, but uh, until the rest of the world decides to adopt a similar cadence, it's going to be difficult to, to get this through. And I, I suppose I would rather have the patch change than play that final week on 13.1 when everyone else has been on 13.2 for God knows how, how many, how many weeks. So that kind of gets my, you know, initial opinions on the the format stuff out of the way. But it it has been very important. And 
last week we did a show about our power rankings coming into spring or I guess winter, I guess we should have said in, in this case. And um, yeah, we've had some struggles, but again, it's a first week of competition getting into a brand new meta and a brand new patch. So there's always going to be anomalies of teams that may not have had the correct read, but who will eventually become good teams. Who did you have as your number one team, Monty? Vitality. Because mine was Excel, so mine's a fucking meme. We'll get to that later. <laughs> right, let's talk about Vitality then. Because I have to say, even though I'm with you, I also agree. Like, that Fnatic one was a bit of a fucking robbery. So they're not really <laughs> yes. three and zero to me. Like, but yeah, yeah, spoiler, exactly. to me, the actual best team at the moment is just G2, but we'll get to that in a minute, yeah. right? But I will say, if you were someone who was hyped to Vi Vitality... I don't think this week could have gone any better because not only did Bo do exactly what everyone hoped he would, because the problem with that player is this. I never thought he could ever be bad individually. Like the eye test says that can't be the case, but you never know if it's going to sync up with the team. That looked all right. But the bigger thing to me, dude, was I had zero expectations for this Photon guy. He actually looks pretty fucking legit, mate. Like, I agree. This team looks way better than I thought they were going to. Yeah. I think, I think with Vitality, when, when we discussed it on last week's show, my question was, how good is Photon? Again, I didn't watch Korean Challengers. I had heard from other people who did that he was probably, you know, top three, but not, you know, head and shoulders better than the other challenger top laners that that were in the league. Um, and he came out with looking extremely strong. Uh, I think that one of the best signs about Photon is that he simply is not afraid of making a game-winning play. Uh, as much as Fnatic threw that final game, Photon and Bo were making very aggressive plays. Like, yes. Photon was making super aggressive TPs to try and make a comeback into that game. And, you know, that is really the cloth that Perks is cut from. And in Absolutely. a way, it seems like this is a very, very good fit for Perks in terms of his play style to be with another solo laner like Photon who is going to all in, who is going to make the Hail Mary play, who is not content with just lying there bleeding out on the floor. And while Perks' own play, I will say, has been questionable. Down, certainly, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and we do have to remember that Perks is legitimately coming off a split where he was in contention for MVP of the yes. league. He had a very good split on a team that was super inconsistent and that ha seemed to have no synergy last year. So we do expect more from him. The rise game that he, I mean, he basically, his bow and photon bailed them out of that fanatic game, but he was just miserable on that rise. He was overextending in the side lanes, dying randomly, giving up objectives. Like his macro sense was, was really off, but at the same time, you come back and you look at the Mad Lions game and you see the synergy that he has with Bo, which already looks light years better than he had with his junglers last year. And that was a huge problem on this Vitality team. And he and Bo really just seemed like they were on the same wavelength. Meanwhile, Neon and Kaiser quietly performing really well in the bottom lane. And I think that it's encouraging if you're a Vitality fan to see this level of synergy and this kind of like, all in style so early on because I think it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better as Photon and Bo get better English, as they integrate with the team, as they figure out their shot calling style, but just pound for pound individually. And holy shit, Bo's mechanics are amazing. Like, they're really yeah. insane. Absolutely, yeah. And the best thing is he's playing to his strengths. So, like, if he is actually this good, he's going to be one of the best. Like I said earlier, the key thing with that player was, this is why we're going to get to the G2 in a minute. Even though, like, it turns out at the moment, it's looking like my cop take is fucking aged terribly about gambling on the Yike guy because he actually has looked sick. The <laughs> difference good. is I would have taken the fucking ball gamble all day long. Like, the eye test was actually, it wasn't just good, guys. It was impossible. It was actually impossibly good for that player. You had to gamble on this guy. So, yeah, if he and if it works out, like I said, this is an opportunity that you just don't get in the West. You do not get like what could be the best Asian jungler just in your Western team before he's even <laughs> won world. So like that, this is like the craziest opportunity ever, Vitaly. And then the, the photon part is just, that's just found money on the floor, Monty. Cause think about it. Even when you looked at this roster, you were like, right, well, since you got Neon and Neon's coach, just play weak side in it. Top lane, like no need to worry about carries. Like the joke is they actually look now at this team will have like massive ad adaptability. Like they could play through any lane in theory. Yeah, it's very, very good. Obviously, we've only seen the Jax and the the Cassante, so I, I, we need to see more from Photon. But I think one of the best signs about Bo, too, uh, that I haven't heard anybody talk about, is that 
let's talk about the games that he's played. He played a Graves game, so he's played a Farming Carry Jungler. He played a Sejuani game, so he played an Engage Tank Jungler. And then he played a Vi game where he played a single target lockdown, you know, backline attack jungler. These are all that's these, everything. these are very that's different it. styles yes. of playing jungle. And yeah. he was good on absolutely all of them. And he seems to know his job within the team. He he really like does his job on these champions in a way that doesn't indicate that there's a massive ego or a desire to carry. Seems like he has trust in his teammates. Seems like, as I already said, he has really good synergy with perks in the mid lane because um, they you know, completely dominated the 2v2 around mid versus Mad Lions. And remember that they did this against a Mad Lions team with El Yoya and Niski who were lauded last split for yep. their synergy, right? And they were just shitting on them. <laughs> um, so I, I think this is, you know, it's a really good sign for Vitality. For me, they're one of the most fun teams to watch right Absolutely. now because I, I know they're they're going to keep giving it their all even if the, the game state goes sideways. And that that's what was so fun about watching G2 and, and Perks' all of Perks' teams, you know, frankly, from back in the day. It's the, it's the Perks magic. And they seem to have found players that really gel with that. I love Kaiser as well. And I love Neon. Like I, I think this team is really, really exciting. And this is a team that at least has the mechanical ability and veteran presence to do well, I think, at international competitions. Yes. And also, to me, it's just so crazy. That you've got, like, another Asian fucking jungler who's just playing psychopath style. Like, the joke is, like, fucking Malran ran so that he walked so that Bo could run, wasn't it? Like, all those <laughs> ones, like, fucking hell, mate. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Like, it's just, he's even more ridiculous than Malran. It looks good, though. I can't wait. I can't wait, mate. Especially, <laughs> by the way, in fact, even in this last week, that Fnatic game's the one right there, Monty. There's, like, what I was talking about with Perks on Cloud9. Even having a shit game, all he has to do is wait. At the end of the game, you get a little cheeky flank off. Yep. There you go. Win the game in it. That's the Perks solved. magic, man. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It, the, the, the thing about Perks, it's so infuriating. And uh, and just talking to friends of mine who, who are more casual about the game, sometimes they get very frustrated watching Perks play. But the thing about Perks is he rarely, he can, he can get you behind, but he rarely makes that mistake that like loses you, like straight loses you the game that results in your nexus being destroyed. And so somehow he can just hang around these games and then eventually he can make a play that actually wins you the game, which is surprising. And it's like his his kind of risk analysis is like, I am going to take this risk, but I know that the worst thing that can happen is not us losing the game. It may be a, a, some level of disadvantage, but I also have the confidence that a future play will be able to turn this around and for us to win the game. And I think you do see that in the Vitality one and or the, the Vitality versus Fnatic one. And people will bemoan the fact that Fnatic didn't win that game, but it was a lot of like repeated attempts and aggressive play from Vitality that eventually found them that opening. Oh, and by the way, in the, when you were saying earlier about how entertaining this team looks like it's going to be Vitality, mate, in that fucking Mad Lions game, that kill that they did, <laughs> fucking Perks and Boar, where he just did like, Perks just did the whole combo and they got Niski. Do you know what I'm on about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fucking baller, <laughs> mate. That was, <laughs> I was loving that. Remember, yeah. this is like a brand new combo. It's what a fucking yes. sick first yeah. week. Yeah, it looked awesome. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, Obviously, the first game was rough, but it it just feels like every game that Vitality plays, they're they're getting better oh, and better. By the way, I can't I can't not say this as well. Listen, mate, you know I even said because I was having this discussion on Best Damn League Show all the last last year because obviously in the spring, if people remember, Hillasang was like an MVP candidate. Then in the summer, he was running it down super bad, and so we had to have those discussions because there's been past years where Hillasang's had like in splits, you know, but they were never as bad. So I even said the problem is. You just worry that like a good like he'll have a good split afterwards and then you're the one who sold him, right? If I'm fucking fanatic, I'm not worried about that whatsoever right now. Because Hillasang <laughs> is doing that thing he does again, guys. You know where he just plays champions like they're different champions. I I genuinely want like this is the meme, Monty. You know that meme with that woman from the fucking office? I don't know the name of the characters in the American office. You know the one where she goes like they're the same picture, like yeah. HQ needs you to tell you tell the difference. Yes. The joke is it's Hillasang, is her. What's the, what's the name of that character, by the way? 
Do you know? Pam, I think. Pam, there you go. It's Pam from the <laughs> office, but it's Hiller Zhang's face. And then obviously it's like, you know, Fnatic HQ needs you to tell you which of these champ what the difference between these two champions. And the two champions are like fucking Rakan and Lulu. And then he just goes, they're the same, aren't they? Because this motherfucker, for real, I've, if I see this once, you know, anyone can make a mistake, bad judgment. I have now seen year on year, Monty, Hiller Sang do flash polymorphs onto people. My brother in Christ, it is not a fucking like lockdown ability like you think it is. Like he thinks it lasts 10 <laughs> seconds and takes half the health of some bro. He is doing flashes. He is flashing like it's a knock up or something. Like all he does is flash in and then just get targeted and killed in sleep. It's so nuts, isn't it? Dude, this guy, well, this guy is so criminal how he runs it down because he just looks like, he always, this the other thing I'll just say as well at least when a Korean has a bad game they flash the camera he's got that like you know poppy dog face with the whites of the eyes like, oh I'm sorry Hillasang has that like smirk like <laughs> I'm, I'm going out like this like bloody hell that Lulu game was criminal man that was that was, was some really illegal bad. shit that was some illegal shit the funny the funny thing about <laughs> Lulu flash polymorph Thorin is that it actually is a big part of the meta right now because Yumi exists sure. and like you want you want to flash polymorph Yumi like that's that's like a good play but it's like he took that part of the beta and just applied it to literally everything, everything. exactly yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> so loud yeah. it o only good on Yumi only good against Yumi turns out <laughs> I mean the joke is if you want to make like a more serious point the problem Hillisang appears to have is he really just is good at champions that do like one big combo thing that's like wins you the fight as it were you know so his problem is when you have something with more nuance like he just play, he, he is the ultimate example dude of that famous saying like you know if all you have is a hammer every problem looks like a nail that's just fucking Hillisang in a nutshell in it in a fucking nutshell I mean, mate and that's what I, that's what I love about him but it's also why we questioned this bot lane duo yeah. because it does seem it already looks like a nightmare weird. it already looks bad <laughs> and the funny thing is Carsey's actually i think doing pretty well he's all right but he's all it, right it's kind of like in spite of hillisang and it's like hillisang you just need to somebody to go balls to the wall with him and just Carsey, i just don't think is oh. going to be that guy it's just not going to be that guy although the weird thing is i do think that Hillisang could be good with a different AD carry, particularly with Niski, who would probably come down and help out Hillisang do crazy dives and shit that he really wants to do. So I think that the team, unfortunately, just maybe I'm not going to say wasn't constructed well because I'm not sure what options they really had. Remember that they were trying. They I'll were drop a, a bomb for you. <laughs> oh, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I'll drop a bomb for you. There's yep. two bombs I'll drop on this episode. One, because they're connected. One, you're going to watch, they're going to connect to each other. One is I've heard that actually if, if basically I've heard Fnatic wasn't looking for an ADC this season, Upset had the gig. So I can't Got say it. more than that, but it actually wasn't that they chose Fnatic Reckless over Upset. But likewise, and this is the dodgy part, I've heard Upset could have been in Mad Lions. And they just went with Kazi or something instead. Like, some, if that's true, mm. if that's actually true, they chose him. Oh, because <laughs> Avid is apparently upset like Silasang. He, he fucks them. So maybe they even would have had the Fnatic bottling as their bottling. Who knows? But that's wild if true. If they could have had upset mates. Really? I mean, there, <laughs> really? There, there, are, there are a lot of issues. Because look, I know the problem is of all the orgs, Mad Lions is going to have that whole thing where their coaches have like, oh, we have a personal relationship with Kazi. We like, I, I could see them being sort of swayed by that jazz, you know? Of course, of course. Yeah, I, well, Mad Lions works in mysterious ways. They tried to, I mean, the whole saga of the El Yoya offloading that couldn't happen. And I mean, right. I, I'm actually, I, I am actually pleasantly surprised that Mad Lions are are doing as well as they are because I figured that some of these guys would have just phoned it in this season. Yes. If I'm El Yoya, I'd just be like, fuck this. I'm just going to wait out my contract. Somebody's going to give me a fat deal, even if I suck this year. What is your level of motivation to play with a team that just like tried to get rid of you multiple times yep. and then fucked up your transfer? And you know you probably could have been on a better team. I'd be pissed. Maybe I'm just petty. <laughs> Maybe El Yoya is just less petty than I am, but uh, I, I would have a hard time playing on this roster. As I said, the real best team just looks like G2. Like, as much sure. as I did that whole thing, it's, it's the problem, Monty. They've done me again, because the outliers <laughs> is what always fucking does you in. Like, I'm totally correct in that analysis. Most times, you'd be a fool to replace someone like Jankos. What a more, remember, last year, was still even good. Like, the chances you ever get someone who's like, the joke is it'd have to be like a ball level talent. Like, the joke, even though we've only seen three games, I'll just say it right now, the Yike guy does look amazing. Like, it looks like, what a fucking great scouting job this has been so far. 
All right, all right. Let's, just walked let's in the door, start I think, I think I think G two is very interesting because we we did bring up questions last week, such as Mickey X being back on this roster. That's a little weird considering they just ditched him and he was good on XL, but it's not like oh he, he you know he's the best support in this league. Han Sama was fucking terrible on Team Liquid in a region that he should have absolutely dominated. And not only was he terrible, but he didn't even look like he was playing the style that we are accustomed to Han Sama playing, which is this really lane dominant, very aggressive. Let me pull out the Draven. Well, the Draven's back, guys, and it fucking is destroying people, which is, I think, really wonderful to watch. So, you know, that synergy with Mickey X it, it seems to be on point. But really... I do want to emphasize how smart the coaching has been on this team. And we often talk about or have had Dylan Falco on this show. But really, this team has been very well set up for success. I think their drafts have been really savvy with the return of the Zeri meta. Now, if you guys remember back to especially summer playoffs, some of the best players in the world, including Viper, were playing Draven into some of these matchups and playing early. Well, they had a really good game plan surrounding the Draven. The Draven draft was good into the Zeri and Yumi. Yikes, pathing was super good and aggressive. Like they have really solid game plans and fundamental understandings of how these lanes are supposed to work and how they're supposed to play around them that is that is just functioning beautifully. Um, so a lot of this, I think you do have to chalk up to the coaching staff at G2 because they have done an amazing job. And I don't think that Yike looks this good if he doesn't have these coaches kind of like very directing very well his early game plans and the way that they're snowballing through bot. The other thing as well is, like, I couldn't have believed that, like, a rookie comes in and it's like, oh, he did, like, pretty good for a guy who's just on... No, he was actually, like, just stomping some of these games. Like, Look at the champions. This guy's picking. Again, just, like, whatever he wants, apparently, mate. Whatever he wants. Yep. Yeah. And, I, I, again, his champion pool seems very wide. But you do have to acknowledge that we need to see what happens when G2 loses bot lane. Um, because... They have been winning bot lane so hard from like the start of the game. If you put your mind back to the beginning of the weekend and you think about the game, the first game that they played against XL, they basically just ran at them with Heimerdinger at level one. And for whatever reason, Patrick hilarious. and Sargamas just <laughs> decided to play scared. A, a very yeah. strange game. I mean, we'll get to Excel and the problems that they have. Like they seem really afraid in they the are. early game. And yes. that's it's not a good look. Um, but Han Sama and Mickey X were just kind of like running at them in that game. And then they're playing like super lane dominant, uh, you know, combos like Draven Nautilus with a huge help from the jungler and the jungle pressure in the early game. So I want to know what happens when this team loses bot. And to me, that's going to be very indicative because as we discussed earlier, a lot of teams have are, around the world are finding ways to win by playing really hard through bot lane and really hard around dragon control. And G2 has identified that, is doing that, has a lot of versatility in that position, and has a jungler that's willing to help. Now, what's interesting to me about G2, so th that's one side of the coin, is like, I feel like we've seen one style, and I need to see more. But the other side of that coin is we really haven't seen a big pop-off performance from Caps yet. And that's scary because we know there's another dimension to this roster. Yeah, he did well in the Zach guys. Yes, that was played at Worlds um, as a Silas counter. Yes, Caps was practicing the Zach against Silas in solo queue at Worlds. That was a, a big conversation point at the time that Worlds was happening. He also built so, yeah, differently if you look like he built for damage on this one. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and like, I mean, we're seeing even Zach jungles these days. These are the ones that, yes. you know, you are you are going for. I mean, Demonic Embrace is just very strong right now. Um, so we have seen it. I mean, Zach can be played out of multiple positions, to be fair. He can be played in like four positions to greater or lesser degrees of effectiveness at the moment. But anyway, um, it was a good pick. And you see the depth of their champion pools, which you expect from a player like Caps. But I want to see what happens when bot lane loses and when caps picks it up with a carry, right. Or when broken yes. blade has one of his big carry performances. Uh, and then we can say, Hey, this team is extremely, extremely well-rounded. There's also the fact that I don't think fanatic is very good. And that was one of their wins. Excel has looked Rocky and then they just crushed Astralis. Who's probably the worst team in this league. 
what what does that mean for the future? I, I am excited to see this team in in best of threes. But I think my my main takeaway was that I think they're really well coached, and I'm super looking forward to the G two Vitality game next Sunday. By the way. <laughs> two things. One is if we talk about former Rogue, now Koi, there's two things to say. One, this must be the most <laughs> reliably predictable team in the history of League of Legends because they played exactly how you'd expect Monty. They weren't the best team. They're not, their flaws pretty good. They're not actually like that strong and super proactive and all the thing you want, but they're not bad. They're just like second or third or fourth best team, like exactly what you'd expect. And also, as an aside, I did see, I think it was maybe on Reddit somewhere, someone did come up with a good joke, which was that because the name's Koi now, the joke is now, if they fuck around, it's called a coin flip. <laughs> that is good. The, whoever came up with that, anytime someone does like the legit Chinese slash Korean style, like with a good nickname, we'll always mention it. So well done. Well done. You landed that one. Landed that one. Yeah, I, I think I think Koi has they've been really good in the early game. Um, they've been really good in the early game. In their loss to Fnatic, that's a game they probably should have won based on the early game state, but they started to make some really super overly aggressive plays, especially with like Shigenda, like randomly TPing places and dying, which then gave Fnatic the opportunity to kind of claw their way back in terms of gold. And then once the grouping starts, it's a compositional problem, right? Uh, Koi, their, 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 their comp in the Koi Fnatic game was Jack, Sejuani, Rise, Jin, and Rakan. This is basically a pick composition, right? You want to be able to either uh, split push with the Jacks, right? Because there isn't a good split pushing answer on the side of Fnatic. Uh, and you want to be able to use the Rise and then the long range engage from, from the Rise ultimate, the Realm Warp, and then Jin and Rakan in order to create picks. You have the conditional engage as well with the Sejuani ultimate. But you're not gonna you're not gonna fight a front to back team fight with this composition into what Fnatic has. Like they have Sivir, they have you know they have a Jace to poke you off objectives. They have the Maokai ultimate. They have Gragas ultimate to separate you. Like you cannot death ball versus Fnatic. And, you know, especially like the rise, too, because he's going to be eating a bunch of ricochets from Sh Sivir because he's short range. So I really think that this was a compositional issue where Fnatic was able just to start grouping it at dragons, poking off Koi or just running at them uh, because they, you know, Koi would have to split up and try and flank. They pop Sivir ult, they just run at one of the sides of the flank and then they just win the fight. So I think Fnatic, this was like an easy mode composition for them. Um, but they were gifted the opportunity to get back into this game by Koi being overconfident with their early game lead. I don't think that happens again with Koi. Um, I think that was, they are probably kicking themselves after that game because it could have been a lot better. Uh, and Fnatic, I, I guess I'm not super impressed because I don't think they really should have had a window back into that game had Koi not misplayed their win conditions. And Fnatic, I'm not. I'm never super impressed by teams that are just like, I'm going to walk onto Dragon and press R and win a game. Yeah, the problem Koi has basically is, like I say, they just don't feel like they have a fifth gear to me. Like, even the game they had against BDS was a bit suspect, mate. Like, what the fuck? I thought you would roll that game. Like, that That was a bit closer than it should be, isn't it? Like, yeah, you win, which is good. You are Koi, you win regular season games. But, like, that's the thing. They're, they're good, but they don't. there's no reason this team's number one for me. Come on. It's just all right. Yeah, team. look, look. I think the Excel win was pretty legit. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, I, that, that was, was a a, that was a, that was another weird game though, and I think you could make. I think that calls into question the choice that they had to replace Odo Amne with Shigenda. Oh, um, by the way, I was going to say this till we talk about Excel, but. Even though people are going to laugh now, like at me and Excel, like, oh, but shit, like, dude, Otto Amnes Elo held. What the hell is this? Like, <laughs> he, he actually looks like if he was just still on coin, it'd be amazing. Like, the fuck? <laughs> yeah, he actually, he was like styling on Shigenda and that. And he's the most cursed versus... player ever at carries. <laughs> Anytime, yeah. it's like there's some sort of a formula in the game where the second, like, Otto Amnes ahead on a carry champion, his team, like, he, he just disappears from the map. Like, he put on the ring or something. Fucking hell. Like, he never, they never properly fucking use his carries do they? they never do it's always think, a waste I, I, I think that game was really hard because with the rest of his team behind he was the main source of day i i don't think that's odo Omne's problem but i think they got into the following bind in that koi game which is this odo Omne is really strong in the side lane he builds blade of the ruin king and prowler's claw so he's in a duelist build and he wants to split push 
And because he is the only one doing well on his team, he is forced to group or Koi just takes Baron. But when he groups, he's squishy as fuck. And there is one million silences and crowd controls coming at him. And he just gets blown up because he can never actually cover the distance in order to get the damage down. And then also everybody starts building fucking Zonia. So as soon as he gets next to them to stun them, they Zonias or they have GA. And I think it's just, I think it was just Soraka as well. And Soraka. Yeah, I think it was oh, kind no. of cursed and unwinnable. <laughs> like people yes. will be like, oh yeah, you know, Odo, what, I can't believe Odo Wabna didn't do anything in that fight. I'm like, he, he, I know he wasn't he's supposed he was, to do. The idea was that he was never going to be in that fight in the first place yes. and like fucking sucks that he's in that fight. You know yes. what I mean? Um, so I think, I think unfortunately like their win condition was not doing those things. And if anything, like, holy shit, Patrick and Dargamas have to step up. Like well, they've you done can't nothing just, whatsoever in these games. Have they? It's you can't be losing that two V two to a Callista Soraka. Like, Come on. You know, they set themselves so far, far behind. And then the other issue that we're seeing with XL is that Xerxe, like, I don't know if he knows where to be a lot of the time. He seems quite confused about how to play on the map with this group of players because he's not really helping anyone, as far as I can tell. He seems rather lost in the jungle right now. And I believe that he will bounce back and, and do something interesting with the rest of his season. But he looks rough. He looks real rough at the moment. Um, and he needs to figure out like it, it's, it's hard to, because it's a chicken, the egg thing where it's like, okay, well, I think I need to play through my bot lane when they're playing this, you know, Lucian and Nami lane, but then they're just dying in the two V two. So what the fuck do I do now? I have a winning top lane, but how do we translate that into a victory? Because we have to have this guy split pushing and how, how is that going to work when they're just grouping up on objectives and they have insane scaling out of this casted in mid lane? It's a, it's a rough conundrum. So Excel feels to me that, they need to fix the bot lane issues and then they need to figure out exactly how they're going to play around this group of players because Xerxe doesn't know where to go and where to apply pressure right now. Oh, no, that's one of the biggest problems I have with this team, dude, is it looks like they do nothing. They just fucking behind. They're behind some more. They're behind some more. What are we waiting for? Like, the sad thing is this. Like, I noticed a lot of people, this just shows you how you can't help fans, mate. A lot of people seem to be tunneling on the Vethio angle. Like, look, he was like, they're, what they're trying to imply is he was like a fraud in all those past splits where he's the MVP and stuff. Like, look, he was just funneled. Like, all they did is just funnel. No, if you watch those games, I'll agree. He wasn't caps, like, just 1v1 killing people 24 like, 7. Yeah, obviously. But if you watch the games, like, at the end of the day, yeah, he got fed and farmed up. But then he would just fucking carry whole team fights. Sometimes one v nine. Like he, the point is in this team, he's never been in a position to do that. Like they don't get to the yeah. late game the way strong. He can do that. Like he's looking up. This, this team's losing their games. Like I say, they're just you, behind, 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 behind. That's it. XL has been smashed in the bot lane against two, uh, you know, top tier opponents in in Koi and, and G two, and that that can't be the way things go in the current meta like you it is very very yes. very very difficult to recover from that in the in the current game state so and, and especially like you're saying they, they look inactive on the map and the funny thing is the kind of the longer the game goes on the better they look a lot of the time so clearly yep. you can see that their veteran mindset is allowing them to remain competitive in games that are pretty long the game versus koi was 40 minutes long for example um, but it's not translating into them dealing with lanes very well. And that's just, I mean, you don't expect that from Patrick and Targamas either. It's not like Targamas was a, a huge liability in lane. That was Flacid last year, wasn't Targamas. And with his champion pool, they should be able to find solutions to some of the issues. But yeah, the dying has to stop or getting pushed in at level one and then playing super passively. But I have to imagine part of that's happening because Xerxe they're not getting a lot of coverage from Xerxe, so they're not feeling confident to play aggressively in some of these lanes. There's some cascade effect of confidence that's happening within this team, and I think you gotta you gotta start with Xerxe and, and having like a more set early game plan. If I was Excel, I would be doing what G2 is doing, which is like, we have a very concrete early game plan to help out our jungler and to kind of give him a leg up and provide a foundation to build the rest of our game plan off of. 
Yeah, the key thing for me with this team is like, luckily, I think the format will be forgiving enough. Like, this will be the team that thus far looks like. Yeah, they fucked up week one, but they'll creep through. They'll get to the best of threes. And the best of threes where if you're good, you'll actually short. Because remember, this is a core where this is a brand new lineup of players completely. There's no core. Here. Like, yeah, I know Odo Amni and Cersei played together like five years ago or something. <laughs> that doesn't fucking count now, does it? So it is a totally brand new squad you put together. I will say, I do, like a lot of people, I'm not as extreme, but I do have a slight concern that maybe they have put too many passive slash late game players together. That's looking like that might be a legit concern, but as long as they gradually leveled up. The other thing as well that I do think is going to be resolved soon in this team is if you just look at what Odo Amne picked this week, Monty, it does look like he was almost sold. Like, it's not going to be like other teams, bro. You're going to get all the carries you want. Like, I think eventually once they fix the fucking bot lane, there will just be some games where it's like, you are the weak side, Odo I'm like, yep, understandable, <laughs> sir. Like, he knows how to do that job, doesn't he? Because they are played, it seems, it seems like they do think they're playing through top lane carry or something. Oh, yeah, I, but he also has been good in those games. Yes, he good. Has been I the thought he was on the I roster. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a hard call. It's a hard call. I don't think that, and Odo Omni's been doing it well for the most part on his own. Too. He hasn't had a significant yes. amount of help from from Xerxes because the other Xerxes thing to been... point out though is is like it also it, it, the real the reason you don't hit the panic alarm quite yet is they did also play like they won against BDS who they're supposed to beat, but the other two were two of the best teams like G two and Koi. Everyone had them top three yep. in the roster, so it also actually in theory this is like the worst start, but you'd expect it to be a worse one. In thought, my problem is just that they didn't look good. Like I actually thought maybe there's a world where they just trip over and look good out the gate. You know, this looks like a fucking massive work in progress, doesn't it? Yeah, and like I said, I think they should have beaten Koi. I think they should have won that Koi game. But what can you do? Um, yeah, I. I, I agree. I think the longer this goes on, the, the the better Excel will look. So not too concerned. I think probably the opposite is true of, of Mad Lions for the most part. Uh, guess we could talk about heretics a little bit. Here's the thing. We didn't technically talk about Fnatic. We just referenced them in context of someone else. Because okay, here's the problem. Fnatic. There's an obvious topic I have to bring up. It really is. You know, we talked on the last episode or the one where they did the LCS rankings about how sad it is that effectively we have to sort of retire shitting on TSM because they're not relevant. And the, the point now where like you can't even make fun. Like what made it funny in the past when TSM failed is they had like enormous rosters. Now they have like a whack one. Luckily, Monty, there are certain trends will always be evergreen. So you know what? Start time to start hitting on reckless again, isn't it? Because these were some mad underwhelming games. What the hell? The only good one was on Siver. Like, are you trying to play into the fucking meme narratives, homie? <laughs> All you can do play is Siver. Like, what is this? Like, because as I say, I said it earlier, guys. As far as I've I've been told, and it seems legit from what I've checked out, they actually could just have upset right now. Well, it, it sounds to me like upset doesn't want to play for like basically. So it's more that he didn't go to other teams and there was all shenanigans with that. By the way, I won't bring it up as a big deal, but spoiler. Did you see that little detail like I referenced earlier where Odo Amne essentially like confirmed everything I fucking said in that like clip on stream, mate, where he just said like it was actually egregious. In fact, you know what? Maybe we'll do five minutes on it. Because he here's the problem I have is this. The reason I have to bring it up is this. To me, it's not a big deal. Teams do this shit all the time. If you don't know, there are plenty of teams that are mad cynical. Like they do it NFL style. Like if I trade you, you're not going to my conference. Like I'm turning you to a bad team. You know, they do all that. Like my problem is this, Monty. People dragged Carlos over the fucking calls over the idea that he contract prisoned Perks, Wonder and Mickey X and Reckless, right? By the way, all of these players got sold eventually. All of them got sold. But the idea was you're scum if you ever say to a player, look, I'll sell you, but I choose the team. Dude, as far as I can tell, Rogue slash Koi have done this with Hans Sama and Odo Abne now. They've just basically said, like, there's only these destinations you can go to. You can, you're not even allowed to talk to this team. Like, they've been my, way more egregious by the sounds of it. Now, I don't have a problem with that, Monty. If you own someone's contract, by definition, I agree with Riot's approach. You have his contract. You decide who he yep. talks to. My problem is this. I'm just saying it's the fan reaction. Like, this just shows how if you don't have a big target like Carlos's big grinning, shit-eating grin, people don't get that <laughs> mad. Like, Rogue the Orc, no one really cares. No one's that bad at them. They're like, whatever. They didn't sell it. Who cares? Because that sounds like Odoam. They got absolutely fucking screwed on that off season, mate. Like, they were telling people during the year, oh, don't bother trying to talk to us about him at the end of the season. He's probably just going to retire. That's like, you're maliciously ruining someone's career, then, mate. Uh, uh, look, I, I'm digging into this right now, and I've heard some. <laughs> 
interesting, conflicting reports about this. Um, uh, it, now, if the facts of the matter was that Odo Abne was going to be a free agent. So I think it's it's different than like the Han Sama thing that was happening where he wasn't going to be under contract anymore. Like come November, um, you know, that was he, he could talk to anybody. Right. And factually, he was not ever given a contract by Rogue at any point during summer or world. So, you know, he knew that he was out basically like they they hadn't offered him a deal so there was going to be a point that he was entirely free now it's also true that s many teams whether because they allow them to talk to other teams before like players allow they allow players to talk to other teams prior to their contract expiring or because of obviously there are always like back back backroom conversations that happen of course. i mean the poaching thing is a joke we all know that um, where most, I would say many, not most, like actually most is fair, probably more than 50% of rosters are constructed or players are promised before the, the free agency window opens. So, you know, not being available during that free agency window can be harmful to players because then they're just kind of thrust into a situation where they're filling holes in rosters that need them rather than being a priority pick that somebody's building around like that can happen. Um, I have seen evidence that he, he was allowed to talk to different teams prior to like basically after they were eliminated from worlds is what I will say. So I don't know what the fuck is going on with this whole messaging right now because there may be truth to there. There may there there may well be truth to like that. Odo Amne couldn't go to certain specific teams or was blocked from those conversations. But I do know that he was able to talk to certain teams and that he was never offered a contract. And so it should have been pretty clear. And as for like who told who that he was retiring, like I don't know about that. Hey, let's be real. Under no circumstances ever should a GM be saying about a player who is no longer under contract to him, don't bother contacting him, he's going to retire. You should never those yeah. words should never be coming at your mouth. Because if they do, that just like the only logical conclusion is you're trying to maliciously limit the person's career or your rival from getting a good player. Yeah. Like and I'm no, just saying, no I haven't, side, you know. I haven't I haven't seen any evidence. Yeah, whatever. One, I, I haven't the key seen thing any is evidence this one way or another on that one. This wasn't just like a community rumor. This came from Odom's mouth himself, so I thought it was worth put on record anyway but anyway to yeah, go back sure. on the Fnatic point it is worth saying I, I even said this earlier in this episode Fnatic also did play a very hard initial group of teams just like XL they basically played out the gate the hardest teams you know so logically I did, look I didn't expect them to win any of these games I had them I was like my fifth or sixth best teams I think it was fifth but I have to say like the reckless angle was a bit underwhelming it actually did look a bit crap in these games I gotta say I, I, I mean especially in the G2 game look <sighs> I don't know what Fnatic was thinking in that game. You are playing against Draven, Nautilus, and Viego, and you're trying to 3v3 with a Sejuani, Zeri, and Yumi? What the fuck? Like, that, that's not going to work in the early... You do not win that 3v3. And well, not only that, so they try and win the 3v3. They completely botch it on multiple accounts. Like, Rux gets caught, caught off on the Yumi and the Tri Brush on the bot lane. Um, he gets flashed on and the Nautilus rooted so he can't reattach. And then after that, Reckless like has a terrible flash where he flashes after the Draven Axis in the air and then dies anyway. So we have just a conceptual mistake here where you just do not win that 3v3 if you're a fanatic. Second off, execution. And third off, just mechanical misplays. Like it was gross. And then the game is just over. I mean, the game was just over from that point forward you do not come back from that with that composition but you just have to know better if you're a professional team yeah if you're a player like rucks making that mistake yeah he's new razork and reckless like come on that's that's not something that you do at a professional level of this game you have to know it's coming it's so telegraphed it's so obvious you do not take those fights ever and the, the worst thing is they they kept taking the fights they, they kept going after it and i guess they thought well We've already lost, so we might as well just see if we can squeak something out here. But G2 certainly had their number.
Actually, cause when Reckless comes back, look, I know part of it was just a meme because of that show match, but they do treat him like the king of the LEC is back. Like, remember, guys, I'm just going to say it one more time because what I learned is the best way to hurt fanboys' feelings, Monty, is not with <laughs> spicy opinions. It's with facts that fucking hurt them because they've because the reality of it that they can't deny it destroys them. So here's the fact that you say to annoy a fucking Reckless fan: you go king of the LEC. What you mean because he won four LEC splits? Perks calls that a good. T- Two years. <laughs> he's done it twice. Done it twice, boys. <laughs> Freck his whole career. He's lapped him twice. Yeah. <laughs> That's the king of the LEC, you morons, folks. If the, here's the problem, right? Reckless only was king of the LEC by default because he just stuck around the longest. Everyone else retired. Expect he retired. Forgot Froggen wasn't even in the region. Forgiven years ago for his own career. So as bench. The joke is in the modern day, he was only by default. Like now it's fucking Caps and Perks and the king of the LEC. Grow the fuck up. That that narrative is years old now, guys. Last time Reckless won, it was in fucking 2018. 2018. <laughs> it's 2023 for fuck's sake, guys. You're, you're cocksuckers who in season four... Keep track. Season four, we're telling me, stop going on about season two, Thorin. That was years ago. Then you all now are like, reckless. I think he could be like contender for best day in the world. Like, it's not th- even that. I know how old day your takes. It, it's not even that. It's like Perks even left the league to give him a chance to. I know. <laughs> he did. He actually did. It's true. And then he got on Perks' team and he fucking took Perks' spot. But by the way, to segue this back in, he won't be winning on this team. Like this, but look, <laughs> again, I'll say they did play a hard schedule, but this Fnatic team just looks like man, the problem with this roster is what like look, the the Rooks pickup looks like a good one. I'll give them credit again. They also actually uh, looks like a nice pickup, but I just don't know. Like this team still lacks something to me. There's a bit of like identity or cohesion I haven't figured out yet with this squad, you know. All right. There are positives. Uh I think humanoid and Razork look like they actually have some level of synergy to start this season, which we didn't expect after it never happening last year. So that's like I think a positive positive development wonder now one of his signature champions has always been Gragas and he's a fucking amazing Gragas player uh and he's put his team in you know had opportunities to win uh, on that champion so if their bot lane can fall in line or at least follow the path that Razork and Humanoid are carving out for them I think this could be a decent team because the biggest uh, thing to me is I mean, the Razork Humanoid team, Synergy. But, you know. If that if Razork Humanoid Synergy suddenly and magically gets solved this year, they could be pretty good. Sure. <laughs> what a world. What a fucking world, boys. <laughs> what a world. I do appreciate, though, because remember... Look, the problem with this one is, again, statute limitations. I have to keep it all fucking just funny and light for now. Technically, Mickey X and Reckless have played together, guys. Who knows? Do they like each other? Do they vibe? <laughs> well, all I'm going to say is, mate, I loved it in that fucking G2 Fnatic game where Mickey X just, like, walked up, ignite. Just like... <laughs> <laughs> that was so really stupid funny. at all. I was, I was laughing so hard. At, him I was laughing he was so recall. hard at that clip, mate. It was so funny. It was so good. That was like that was the ultimate like needle right there. Like, oh, I know that was great. That was legitimately just what a smile to my face that moment. Mate. He was so yeah, chatted as well on it. I know. I, I was really wondering when he was walking up what was going to happen. I was I like, know. is he gonna is he gonna like stop him with a Nautilus fuck? Like, what's he doing? And he just like ignites him and walks away. <laughs> I love it. It's chatted. It's chatted as fuck. <laughs> what about, oh, here's the yeah. thing though, of the teams that are in the league at the moment, the problem is it actually hasn't gone that, like, look, I obviously didn't expect Excel to be that bad and maybe I've, maybe like G2 slightly better than I thought. Well, no, they have to be item fourth as much. G2 is better than I thought. The thing is, it, the league in general is the way I thought it would be though, Monty. Like realistically, like the reason why, as you said, let's just talk about Rex now is because aside from Rex, who gives a shit about these other teams, mate? Like there is like a really, really nice, the, par- the parity of the top five to six is legit. After that, who cares? It's just a mix just, after that. I'll do the other ones for you really quickly, guys. BDS is crown shot in ELO hell. Yep. Feel super bad for that guy. He probably should be on a better team. Uh, SK Gaming, there were insane... This is going to sound weird to you guys. There were insane scrim bucks coming into the start of the season. Apparently, SK was doing very well in scrims. That did not translate really to any kind of, I think, consistently good stage performance, at least at this stage, even though they did beat Heretics, has to be said. Uh, who else we got? I'm not talking about Astralis. Dayor is terrible. Oh, no, no, it's Astralis, yeah. Astralis yeah, is the other team. Dayor needs to be replaced. Like, we're not going to talk about this team until that they team just sucks a, a in general, guys. It's just not good. <laughs> so, just a whack lineup uh, in it. Yeah. Dayor needs to go. 
now on to on to heretics who has been interesting to yeah. watch because they did very well against Astralis, which I guess is not really too indicative of anything. Um, they, uh, they've been fun to watch in a variety of situations. I think Evie has been a lot better than I thought he would be at the start of the league. Like his little duels with photon up in the top lane were really fun to watch in the vitality versus heretics game. Uh, they lost to SK. I think this is a high variance team. I think this team has the skill to take out, you know, be a trap team to some top competitors, but at the same time, they can be their own worst enemy, at least in the short term. I mean, you can even see sort of like, like, obviously we made this point on the last episode. It was all going to live and die on like the Ruby guy pick up as the middle. That doesn't look that bad. Actually. I can sort of see maybe why they've gambled on this yep. player. Like the, you, there were some positive signs. You know, I'm cautiously optimistic about this team. Uh, Ruby did have a, a, a again. W we we temper this by saying it was against. I was against about Dayor. Dayor. <laughs> yes, exactly. Dayor is really bad. Uh, and how can you really evaluate that? I I do think that this is this is going to be an interesting team to watch. Ruby, I think is is. Knowing nothing about this guy, he actually does seem to have both he and Evie have some synergy with Yankos already, which I've enjoyed watching. But this this team has a long way to go, but I think can potentially pull off some best of one upsets and at least be a little bit interesting. Like put it this way, the Evy guys, Cassante, it was like that wasn't bad, man. That was, that was yeah. some good players he pulled off. Yeah, he had some yep. nice moves. Yeah, he 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 gets into it too. What I love about Evie is He's not afraid to go for those 1v1s. That's that's always been who he is as a player, is he he loves all inning. And in a world where I, I would say that there's not a lot of attention in the West paid to top lane, if you can start to get some of those advantages through 1v1ing that you know the jungler isn't going to interfere with, you can have some fun up there and maybe actually carry a game. And split pushing is a viable tactic right now. So there are win conditions here for Heretics. I think it's a fun roster. I, I at least want to watch them play, unlike the rest of the teams that we mentioned towards the bottom of the table, because they intrigue me. Or I they hope have it's nice just spots. that at least if the Ruby guy can have some pop-offs, then maybe him and Jankos can like collectively do something in some of these games, you know? No, the joke is this, though, mate. I do still think it's mental that, like, there was all those years where, like, half the pride of Europe was like, we don't even import. Like, it's one thing not import Koreans, but we just import Japanese players. That, like, what? <laughs> That's not even that. a thing. Like, okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you want. What a weird thing to do, though. It's so bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> That's why I want to watch them. At least they have character. I mean, it's like Definitely. Peter so, Dunn imports Japanese. Japanese psycho 1v1 top later. I'm look, man, I'm into that. <laughs> they may not be the best team, but they made me watch them. That's what I'll say. Whereas exactly. like, I no, mean, there's a no joke in there. So will about, make me watch Astralis. <laughs> you know, this does sound like some sort of a joke about like the wreck machine being used to get like, Oh, look, we took misfits. It was like a really strong, you know, a playoff dark horse that could make some out of nothing, put it into the wreck machine. Oh, it's come out as it's got, and plus anime. We've got a Japanese top player. That's weird. The hell? He's got a weird Japanese top player. Now. The yeah, hell? And Peter Dunn. Yeah, who knows? Oh, true. <laughs> who knows how that works? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think look, that's... Look, to bring it back to what I said before, though, the reason I was excited for the LEC split is, it, look, G2 and Vitality look more dominant than expected, but, like, crucially, the parity is there in this league, dude. Like, this looks like... It, I'm actually even loving the fact that you've got this parity, because think about how perfect it is. The parity, Monty, is literally the top five, if you're very generous, six, if you believe in Madeline. The top five to six is the teams we care about, and this format means it's almost certain we're just going to get them to the point of the tournament where they play all the awesome oh, yeah. series, and then we get that amazing and fucking play off. this actually looks like this lec it, this format is going to work out like a motherfucker i can tell it looks great yeah i mean this goes back to riot's format how cool it is monty to know that you're only two more weeks of the bo ones being over the round robin's over in two weeks i know it's not sick it? and then we get three weeks of actually yeah. like cool it's double be elimination awesome. best of threes it's a it's a good format i one wonders because Again, it's it's just a typical riot bullshit when they announced all these new formats for Worlds and MSI. They're like, you know, it worked well in the past, but we've decided that things are different. It's like, why? The game's the same. You could have just done this from the beginning. There was nothing preventing you. My favorite thing was yep. that when they were talking about the when they made that post about uh, like the the analyst desk and the future of the LCS. 
Oh, hold on. Let me find it. It's too, it's too fun. I gotta, I gotta find it for you because the language they use about some of their previous decisions, such as moving away from the sports broadcast format. It's like, motherfuckers you guys never had to do that in the first place there was nobody with a gun to Dude, <laughs> anyone who's an OG it. fan right now and knows the deep law of summoning insight will know what i am saying about now is a fact the joke if you go back monty to the first year 2014 of summoning insight we were talking even back then that the joke at raya is the opposite of what you just said there the opposite was it was actually that you would awkwardly intentionally crowbar the nfl as a reference point into any possible format slash like decision you wanted to put forwards in riot hq because it just this, in, it just increased your chances that like some exec guy who only knows the nfl would go like oh like like the joke is it's just like you're the most loaded way to set the topic up like you just essentially say like yeah we could do this uh you know like they do in the nfl and then it's like he'd like come out of his nap like someone say nfl oh yeah I like this guy. He's a thinker. He knows the future. That, the, you're right, Monty. As usual, Riot's done that thing of like, we have changed our minds because we actually never wanted to do that originally. We always thought we were going to now. It. We're successfully it. doing a better thing, what we could have done all along, but we're only doing now because it's only better now. And here's why we were always right all along, but have still changed our minds. But I haven't really changed our minds because we've just leveled the game up. Like, dude, nothing will ever beat that explainer though for this year. Like when they were trying to simultaneously, it's like they can't even like take, they don't even have the decency to just mind fuck you. Like give you like, di- like give you like, you know, Dine, wine, dine, mind fuck you, just you dedicate. They haven't mind fuck gangbangs. They were simultaneously trying to explain to me that like double limbs awesome for MSI. And then I'm like, what about worlds? Like, well, I'll get to that because for worlds it would be very inappropriate. Like, what the fuck? Like simultaneously coming at you. Have you found it yet? No, I can't find it. That's the right. crazy thing. So I'm working on it, finding the LCS uh, on air talent. I'm guessing this that. is when they were like, ex- was this what was this when they explained like the talent list, or was it when they were explaining like yeah, Dash I got think, that second show or whatever? You know, I, I think it was all part of that, but I can't find. It, of course, because it hasn't been like linked on Lolly Sports. It's not in the news of. By the way, Lolly let's. Sports. There's another thing I want to put on the record right now, Monty. I made this point last year when they never ever made a news post on the fucking website LOL Esports. Saying that Evil Geniuses had a fucking sub change and that Kyrie was in the team. They never ever put that on the news website, by the way. So in theory, if you only follow League of Legends through LOL Esports, Monty, you turned up to that fucking lower bracket match and were like, who the hell's this guy playing? Like, that's like a trend. Have you noticed this? Within the last year or so, they barely update that bloody website. Like, even the VODs aren't up sometimes. Like, what's yep. going on? This is the main website of the biggest game in the world of esports. What's going on? Good. To find VODs, I just have to go to a LOL event VODs or literally go to the channel and like click the live YouTube tab and go to the four hour VOD right. and then just go around in there. That's how I have to watch games because it is actually impossible to watch games live because there's 30 minutes of delays of every game and I'm not going to waste my life that way. Uh, I did find it. It is in the LCS Spring Pr- Spring Split Primer. Okay. So here we go. You ready? You ready for this? In order to properly set the tone for the next decade of LCS, we're making bold, creative choices with our broadcast coverage. For years, we've clung tightly to a model aligned with traditional sports, a host, an analyst behind the desk, filling minutes between games. That familiar, digestible style served us well, but esports coverage must be more than business as usual. In an increasingly crowded content marketplace, we need to give LCS fans a compelling reason to watch and engage with the league. By the way, that's an implication that they weren't doing that er, er, previously, which they weren't doing. So I mean, means by taking... their own logic, Monty, they haven't done it for 10 years. <laughs> exactly. For 10 <laughs> years, by their own logic, they haven't given fans a compelling reason to watch and engage with the league, which, by the way, is their flagship company project. Like, <laughs> so it's amazing, it's actually amazing. just too funny. Yeah. Um, doing so means taking big bets, eschewing the status quo and dreaming big. Why couldn't you have done this previously? There was literally nothing stopping you except, like you're saying, Thorin, there were a bunch of dinguses who, by the way, still work for Riot yep. and also got promoted both on the league ops and the production side. The producers who made these choices have been promoted to like running worlds at League of at Riot Games. And they never made these changes. And not only that, but the they actually just disempowered the talent syst- systematically at LCS. 
they would throw out people would i know a bunch of the talent obviously they would present ideas and pitch ideas and the producer would be like nope can't do that can't do that can't do that won't do that nothing no we're just going to do the same thing we do every week in and out because we don't want to do the extra work and spend the time in order to make the product better we don't trust the talent to do things but also that's a lot the opposite of, are, of lec right yeah exactly and also a lot of the producers are paranoid because they think that if it, the if one of the casters has a good idea and it pops off then what the fuck is their job? Which yeah. is accurate. What is their job at that point in time? Um, and what was their job ever? So you literally are still, if you believe that this is true, Riot Games, you should be firing all of those people who created the garbage product for years because you could have done this at any point in time. And you're basically tacitly admitting that you were successful in spite of yourselves, not because you were doing the best possible thing creatively, and you're only doing it now because your viewership for LCS is in the absolute trash can and you have to compete with more entertaining forms of content because you spent years not being entertaining. Meanwhile, I take a look at LEC and they've got all these little skits that are happening on the broadcast, like the whole like Vettius and Dracos like staring at Bo. And yeah, some of it's kind of cringe and you're not going to hit 100% of the time. But you know what? At least I find it interesting and like fun and they knock things out of the park and they do all their songs, you know? And yeah, I don't like everything that they do, but they do come up with a lot of good shit. And at least and by it's the way, interesting to watch. By the way, since obviously this all came from the whole Dash drama, right? Mate, that in itself just gave me such a bad taste. Because if people don't know, if you ever see this order of events happen in a sequence with Riot, Riot makes some really bold move without messaging correctly to the fans. So the fans have no idea why. The fans react appropriately or overreact and go mental and go, this is fucking the end of the world. Riot then immediately, they will always immediately do it, quickly try to rush out of the door a quick fix that makes it seem like you addressed the issue, but you don't really. And then also you message it as if you always planned on doing it. So what they did here, you know this, is spoiler, think about it, guys. Do you think Dash hates the LCS and wants to ruin their broadcast? He wouldn't go out there the way he did on his stream and make those comments if he was really happy and the whole time it was just planned that he was being unleashed and getting a better job and moving to this. No, <laughs> what that implies is exactly what you all saw on the surface is that he got his job taken from him. By the way, the timing couldn't be better. He's literally just been voted the best in the world at his job, you fucking morons. You imbeciles. Essentially, you've just been told, if you're right, the one good thing about your broadcast was this guy doing exactly this role. So you then went, I'm downsizing, so actually just fire him. And then when you'd fire him, right, obviously all the fans are like, what the hell? We also love him. Hence why he just won best in the world at his job. So then you're like, scramble, scramble quickly. Just get like a, get like, dude, here's what you even do. I'll just make it even funnier. You don't even just go, like reposition his job. Because this gig here, I'm telling you right now, if you look at what he's doing, Monty, there's no way, I'm going to say it right now. I don't know, pure speculation, but I don't think there's any universe he's getting paid as much as he was for being the oh, desk. Yeah. So nope, this nope, is, nope. instead, this is more like, since the peasants won't leave her, they're angry. You're like some fucked up medieval <laughs> feudal lord. You've just done that move where you throw the tiny pouch of the, of the gold coins on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Not even to, you didn't even pass it to Dash. You throw it on the floor, so he has to like reach down to like, uh, yes, master. aren't you grateful? <laughs> I know exactly. And then now he's just some fucked up jester before the show starts. Like, look, the actual concept, by the way, sounds good. Although I'll say this as well, Monty. Riot is so fucked in the head now that now they can't, they even try to like scoop their own ideas because now it, like you're saying, now it's a regional office battle. So even though, Monty, you know, when they said about this content, like there'll be this brand new content where Dash goes around and shows you a new. Yeah side to play yeah i saw that it's called shocks and around she did it in like fucking like five years ago you remember when she went like ice skating with Jan course like dude yep. that feature existed by the way it was a good feature like you can imagine shocks got like all different side i even think dash will probably do a great job it's just that the point is that that feature is irrelevant to whether the well, desk is good or not like as you say that's a big well, smoke screen they just didn't want to pay for the desk let's well, be real yeah yeah, no, they don't. They didn't want to pay for Dash, I think is ultimately it. And we'll get into the interview that they had with Travis about shit about LCS, which was hilarious, by, by the way. way. Monty, look, here's the thing. I don't usually call people out who haven't dissed us or been rude to us. And normally, you know this, I like g -Bay. For me, g -Bay is the documentary video version of Fionn. What they do, uh, what they're good at, they're the best. And they have their own little flaws, but whatever. Everyone's, yeah. No one's perfect. But mate, he actually did a tweet the other day that would fucking melt your brain he actually <laughs> said and i'm not joking that travis is like the 
most influential like LCS person ever, or some some right. mental sort. Like I can't even believe he hit send tweet. Like look, yeah. that's look, like here's, trolling here's or something. You, here, what? Here's what you guys should know: Travis redid that interview that you saw. What? <laughs> We did. That was that, that was, was a do over. A mulligan. Fuck he went in at a different day. <laughs> he had a mulligan they, on an interview. They no, no, it wasn't Travis. It was Riot asked him to redo it. That's what oh, a creature. That's what a creature of Riot uh, he is. Is that as I understand it, that was not the first shot at Jeez. that interview. So Jeez. it was the most softball. We'll get into it. I want. I want to get through this first because it's too funny to talk about. To talk about. Come on, uh, hit me with it. The rest of this. So it's like, but here's here's the logical flaw in what they're doing, in what they're doing with the desk. So you you hired all of these people to be on a desk, right? So why did you hire them? What's their skill set? Being on a desk. Legends? Yeah. Yeah. Talking about doing an, an analyst desk in League of Legends. So you're gonna change the entire format and do new segments, new presentations, building on that foundation this year, reinforcing our commitment to highlighting player stories through gameplay breakdowns, original sketches, match commentaries, new player profile series. So here's my question. If you are going to be changing this format to a more, I would say, dynamic format that requires like moving from segment to segment quickly, potentially acting in sketches, why the fuck would you get rid of Dash, the guy who moves the show along and who is literally has a BFA from one of the best acting schools in America? Like, why is that the guy you get rid of? You have a desk full of analysts. You change none of the analysts, zero of those analysts, despite the fact that they don't have the skill set that you say you want. You yes. hired them for an analyst desk and you're saying, no, now they're going to do all these other things. And I'm not saying they can't do those things, but the logic that Dash is the guy who goes in this new format is completely wa wacky. It's completely wacky. Like the person you get rid of are, are the hardcore analysts if you're trying to change it into more player narratives or fun comedy sketches. That, that's just how it works. Like, I don't know. And the only change they made at Talent was they got rid of Pastry Time, they got rid of Dash, they got rid of Freak, and they brought in one new person. That's not how you mix up a broadcast. That's not also, how you just, do it. Just the way they wrote that fucking thing also just killed me inside, dude. The way they just had the gall to actually write that line about like, we've, we're have we unleashing Dash, what, from like a fucking stable income and like stability in his career and you know, knowing how many years to do it. What are you talking about? You made his life worse, you idiot. You're unleashing him from his ability to pay his mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it's like it, none of this stuff actually makes sense like if you're gonna if you're going to make these changes like go big like get a bunch of new people in there you know what i mean like you changed one caster you added one you deleted people and you added one new face and you told people that were hired for one job that they were going to be doing what look it either is an extremely different job in which case you should have hired different people or it's not an extremely different job and you're not changing the product pick which pick which one it is pick which one it is I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, I also think, by the way, this is another example of a piece which doesn't, which pretends it's explaining while giving no reasoning at all, Monty. Like what what riots learn to do is they've become true politicians, Monty. What they do is they just tell you what to think instead of telling you what they're doing. Like instead of saying, Monty, why they think sports desks don't connect with the fans and or what's maybe changed in esports. Why was it relevant in yep, 2016? I would love that. to know the Instead of doing that, that, they just tell you as a matter of fact, like, you know, it's not engaging anymore and people People just don't enjoy it. Like, oh, okay, then, well, I'll just update my whole mainframe with what you say. I guess now, by the way, I won't bother watching sports or any other esports. Yeah, why is shit, it working it, in know? sports but not in esports? Why did you think it know. used to work in esports? Because it worked in sports. It is an obvious it one. Place? You're implying LEC shit, you morons. <laughs> yeah, they do the desk. Think about logically, if LEC has an analyst desk, why does theirs engage fans and make people care, compelling reason to care about the league? I, like, think, I, I, I think this... Look, it makes sense in the it, it only makes sense in the following context, which I agree with, by the way. People I have said that I support the date and time changes of LCS because doing nothing was definitely the wrong move. They were they were slowly bleeding viewership, they were bleeding excitement. If you do nothing, guys, there's no hope of saving LCS. There's none. It, it, the downward trend continues. I firmly believe 
that they should be mixing this stuff up very aggressively. And I think that, Thorin, they're saying this because they have to differentiate themselves in a certain way to drive hype, even if it isn't the best way. We need to be curious about it. And guess what? It's working. I'm going to watch it on day one because I'm curious about what they're going to do. So it already is working. Uh, and you can't just do nothing and allow it to die. So I actually respect the fuck out of the decisions that LCS is making because they're bold at the very least. Like, at least they're trying things. Should they have been trying things a long time ago? Is it hilarious to see their, you know, after their their hindsight, ludicrous justifications because it it doesn't hold together logically at all? But they're not going to actually admit the truth. But what they are doing is they're saying, this product is failing. We need to make big changes. Big changes are the only things that are going to save us. And now we're in a period of experimentation. And I at least think that's respectable. It's a respectable goal. And it is way better than continuing to do all the bullshit that wasn't working. So I think it's good. I think it's good at the end of the day. I just don't like their extremely messaging stupid all. messaging and their just absurd arrogance in this yes. messaging. Because frankly, the decisions have led to this point of failure. You had every single advantage in League of Legends. You had every single advantage over LEC, and you just straight lost through your own incompetence. And you just got to own that. And it's new leadership at that league now. Hopefully, it'll be better. Now, the, the Travis interview was even funnier because it was the people were like, oh, wow, he really asked all the hard questions. It's like, no, he didn't. All they said he he never tacked them down on specifics, especially about the buzz, budget. Oh yeah, we're not we're not cutting the budget. It's like, are you cutting the budget to the talent? Is that why you couldn't have Dash? Where is the budget going? Is are you spending it more on marketing now? Are you spending less on production? And also the the conversations that Riot has said about the budget, because John Needham, who's the head of LOL Esports, has consistently said we're spending more on esports in 2023 than we have in any other year. Now, this logically makes sense because they're building out the entire Valorant calendar. You know what I mean? Like they are going to spend more money because it's a more robust Valorant calendar and they're not cutting back on their, their League of Legends calendar. But that doesn't mean it's going to League of Legends. When you say we're not cutting the budget for, you know, the LCS, does that include, did you spend a bunch of the LCS budget redoing the studio because you had to make it a studio that could go to Valorant on weekends? And right? they also questions. collectively say that, like, this was going to be the biggest year ever or something. Like, the budget overall was incredible. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Didn't they say yeah. Yeah, of, well, of eSports Riot. Oh, e it, was, it, it, it didn't of just come to your point, right? I see what you mean, right. But But it's like... Okay, so you can say we actually increased LCS budget this year. That might be possible. But my next question is, you guys had to redo the entire studio, which is very, very expensive to do. And because you needed to make it so it wasn't just LCS, it was Valorant. Was that a big Here's something I've got to ask you, Monty. Budget? Here's an obvious thing that should be asked, but they just at this point refuse to ask it by the fact that they've gone to all these dark days and they're still refusing to stop doubling down. Why is it still in LA? Am I missing something? Like, guys... Because they own the building. Yeah, even so, though, mate. Like, th think about the amount of... I bet just, like, union costs a load of fucking nightmare. Oh, it's, it's you know what I mean? It's like, absurd. I feel like if you need to cut the budget, don't fire, like, really great people for your broadcast. Like, cut corners elsewhere. Go move, relocate or something, you know? Because, because Riot is afraid to tell hundreds of people to move to Chicago. I mean, look, jo I'll insert a joke here. In 2023... I wouldn't want to be told to move to Chicago either. So. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Sleep there. Look into it. Chicago's Google. fine. <laughs> Depends which part you're in, but okay. <laughs> I don't think they'd be putting in the part you're thinking about. But uh, I, it, look, I think that there are definitely, we've, we've brought this up before, that it's extremely expensive to run it in Los Angeles, but because they want to, a bunch of people want to live in Los Angeles and because they own this building that is across the street from the main Riot campus. It's the old G4 TV studio that they bought and then turned it into the, the LCS studio. But they made a mistake a long time ago, and it's super expensive. And for whatever reason, they are not insisting that people uproot their lives and, and move it. And they could certainly run it for cheaper. But it's, it's not just that. It's that in that interview that Travis did, there are no actual concrete answers. Like, here are the questions that should have been asked. Okay, so you say you're spending more money on LCS. How much of that are you allocating towards content and talent, right? How much have you allocated towards 
uh, fixed costs such as you know renting equipment that you need for this new studio how much of it was renovating the studio which was also was that budget split for renovating the studio between valorant and league of legends did that come out of the lcs budget did you create i don't know if that's true it could have been an entirely separate budget that had nothing to do with valorant or league of legends but you have to ask these questions because you can't just you can't just let them say we increased budget because that doesn't tell you any. It would be my dream. Sadly, for obvious reasons, this is not going to happen. But my dream would be that some character, the obvious person would be Richard Lewis, would actually find out the real breakdown of the Riot esports budget. Because here's what's here's the one thing I want to know so badly, Monty. Just show me the section which is just all the execs and how much they get paid. All I need is there, because all you need to know, guys, if you know how many fucking millions probably go to those guys, like it's egregious. <laughs> it's so egregious. If you need the people that probably do fuck all, they're on like two hundred fifty k. Like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, probably there more must be a whole handful bonuses. of those. Uh, yeah, with all their money. bonuses, well, way more. Because anyway, here's the downside. You, you know when you're a fan and you see that news that sounds like good news for esports and it'll be like, you know, hey, some person from, insert like CNN or NFL or fucking ESPN, someone's moved over to a like ESL. They've joined ESL or Riot. That sounds great. Spoiler, their contract's what I've just described. It's like the most loaded out contract ever with like yep. amazing base salary. Like you see like bonuses, fucking sometimes equity, like... But yeah. the joke is, if you have too many of those people, which I've heard was the case that the you know the fucking upcomers of the world and the G fours of the world, that alone will kill your budget because you're just getting you're just getting drained from all the fucking cash. That's not even stuff that you were spending like to do something like we're talking about something good for the show. Like sometimes yeah. you're just wasting it on a guy that maybe it's the equivalent of buying the wrong player. Like the joke is in this scenario, you bought Kingen. There you go. <laughs> and tell you what, we've got all sorts of Kingens in fucking Riot games. Because <laughs> they've already done their king and move, haven't they? Like, I was in the NFL. Well, you know what? You were probably really good in the NFL. I don't really want to see what you're going to do in the LCS, but I guess we'll I mean, see gonna, now, right? We're going to find out. I mean, exactly. I, I, am, I am excited to see LCS. And, you know, I hope they fix it. And there were some things in that Travis interview. It wasn't, there were some ridiculous takes from the community, such as Riot wants to kill the LCS. Like, that's just stupid. Like, they clearly don't want to do oh, that. No, uh, people just don't understand that. Uh, they're too dumb to read between the lines. It's like I said, they couldn't just do nothing because it was failing. You have to do something to try and like revive the, the product. So what they're done is they're charging the paddles right now to see what they can do. And I agree with that, the decision that was being made. And they said, what if we moved it into this higher audience time slot where more Europeans are awake? I also agree with the fact that they moved the, the time back two hours. I would have put it at that time, the 2 p.m. Pacific time zone in the first place, because as I said previously, fuck California. It's, you know, the, the West Coast of the U.S. is 17 percent of the population. You're trading that for all of Europe being able to watch your product. It is a good trade objectively from an audience, from a maximal maximizing your audience perspective viewpoint. I totally would have done that exact same move if I was in charge. 100 percent. So I agree with some of these choices that are being made. I agree with mixing it up. I agree with trying to be a little bit more adventurous, adventurous creatively, but you can't just allow them to be mealy mouthed on these interviews and you can't let them do the interview over again. Like for fuck's sake, Travis, like you got the interview and when they're like, oh, I guess that didn't go as well. Oh, we should have answered that differently. Could you softball this question a little more to us? Like, no, no, that's not journalism. I mean, not that we're surprised, but he's a mouthpiece for Riot, guys. He's not going to ask, ask the tough questions. He's not your hero. He is doing Riot's bidding, and he will do it multiple times if it, if it pleases them. By the way, here's the real problem LCS is going to face. It ain't yet. Here's, uh, I'll connect it to the topic we talked about, like, I'm going to guess like an hour ago. The real problem Riot is going to have is in, are you ready? Mark your calendar three weeks from now. Because the second LEC, Monty, moves to that GSL best of three part, the LCS format is going to look really bad in comparison. Like, we're okay now because we're just doing BO1s. Everyone's doing BO1s. As soon as we move so the LEC gets to the really good parts of the format and gets better and better and better, dude, it's going to make LCS look ass in comparison. That's the so, problem. So here's, here's the thing, Thorin. As I understand it, the reason why they didn't change the LCS format is because they promised the team owners, they made an agreement that they wouldn't change the format until 2024 because they've changed it so many times. Like the playoff formats have been changing and like they were switching the days, like having Friday night, like Monday likely, blah, 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 blah. And so the, I think the owners got fed up with it after a while because they were making so many changes and they wanted some stability. So I don't think 
it's a lack of desire from the LCS to not change the format. I, I actually do believe that with the people who are in charge of LCS right now and the other changes that they're making, it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't take a risk on a format at this point in time with all the other kind of risks that they're taking. There's no reason not to at this point. Like you say, yeah, there's no reason fact, not to. In fact, you want to have a high variance gamble, like you say. Correct, correct. I, I would Mac, I would I would just load the variance on this one if I was them. In fact, I think they're not doing, I don't, I don't think they're going crazy enough. No, no, I agree. Put uh, it this way, Monty. I would literally be throwing out there, like you'll talk about drastic ones. I would do stuff like, I would do things like, I would actually do what they did do in their statements, just they did it disingenuously. I would take the whole concept and throw it out the wall. Like I would do things like gamble, like maybe one day a week, like a casual week and that actually she is for real, like Tyler Wood and a bunch of other casual people just talk about league from the fun side and about the champions, not the players. Then I'd have one where it's like maybe there's one where it is just Dash and Emily Rand going super. Th- you know, you should try everything at this point. I'm with you. By the way, as an aside, for LEC though, mate, their Monday night schedule looks fucking awesome. That's a banger actually to be able to watch the weekend and then come into Mondays. It looks like it works great for LEC that. I mean, I I prefer it being on weekdays because it was, you know, frankly, as an adult. It's horrible to have those days, LCS and LEC last year, where it literally starts at 9 a.m. and then goes until 5 p.m. That's the entire it's your entire fucking weekend. Literally, if you want to watch the games, it's much better if you can just kind of pop it on after work and watch the games. And that way it frees up a lot of time. I I, personally, at least for for me and my lifestyle, like I I would obviously like my lifestyle is watching these games. So I do it regardless. But if if I were to think about having a different job and working a normal life, you know, having a normal life, being a normie, it would be better for me. Um, now, obviously, not better for me if it's in the middle of the day, but for most Americans, the vast majority of Americans who are going to watch it, it's not in the middle of the day anymore. It starts at 5 p.m. It's whatever, right? Uh, so I, I think it's good. I think it makes more sense. Um, I think it, it'll it take some time. And here's here's a prediction for you. It's going to be bad viewership in week one. People aren't going to know when it is. People aren't going to be used to this schedule. They're not going to get the host in from LEC. And there's going to be a lot of doom and gloom. About oh, I guarantee this. there'll be a day where one of the days when they start early, Monty, someone will just capture one of those nightmare screenshots that'll show like, you know, 25K live viewers or something, you know, like some number that's so bad because it'll be at like exactly the wrong time. That'll, that'll be the meme. I guarantee that'll happen yeah. soon. And, and it will because people want to shit on it. And oh, they do, of course. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people will find it funny because, like, obviously, we want to shit on it too. Uh, people will say, oh, that's you guys. But I try and be fair about these things. And I think that it is going to suck at least for a while until people can get used to it. But this is in the long run. I think this is, again, doing nothing was going to change. You couldn't do nothing. So we have to see if this you is know, going to work. The thing, though, There's no way to diagnose this <laughs> until months from now. Here's why it doesn't make sense when people will try and be like, well, that's rich from you guys. You guys just hated on LCS for 10 years and made a whole career off it. Like, no, because here's the problem I have, Monty, is I'm not going to hate like a contrarian no matter what. My problem is this. I actually, it, it irritates me so much because I'm an older individual who's followed many sports and esports. So what pisses me off is this, Monty. You know, I actually generally find like the European approach to sports not that great for TV. I find it has a lot of flaws. And the joke is in things like European soccer, I actually think they're decades behind. Like if you don't know, even one of the broadcasts they do for European soccer, which ha- it's, a, it's CBS in America does it with like a bunch of like famous European people. Theirs is more like inside the NBA and everyone's loving it. It's got that vibe. Like the joke is this, Monty, when I watch American sports, I think the American broadcasts are the best thing about the sports. Their broadcasts are amazing. And in fact, I even like the angle that everyone normally hates on, which is whenever, you know, people complain, for example, about the NFL or the NBA, like, oh, it's so simplistic, the analysis, because by definition, it's for the most people possible. It's supposed to be for the boomer guy who just finished his job and he's drinking a Bud Light, isn't it? Like, it's not the guy who's like fucking breaking down the X's and O's, like, no, they didn't run a very good, like, slant right there that's that you're going too far from that so the problem i have is i just want that monty i want a really slick done broadcast with all the bells and whistles i even want by the way the jats and the freaks of the world i just want them to do it where it's like they all have their distinct role like freak can give me the hot take jack can give me the normal like down the middle to, if they did that right that's all i'd want mate. if they did that right i'd enjoy it genuinely you don't have to i don't even need all the crazy stuff lec does it's just that for bizarrely riot games just doesn't get that aspect they've never really nailed that part as well you know well, they the only also... advantage back in the day, let's be real, was money. And so they used to just have better camera equipment and better like filming people or whatever. Now that that's not like an advantage, it, it's a bit underwhelming now. I mean, but also like they've never allowed that kind of synergy to develop with their, with that's their true. talent. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, they did they did run the the kind of stable analyst desk for this last year, which people liked a lot more. You'll yeah, notice. Yeah. Uh, but the year before that, it was like it was like a bazillion people on the analyst desk. If you look at historically, the analyst desks that have been received the best in League of Legends history were like the ones with me double lifting Crepo and like Quickshot, which is us, the entirety of worlds, only us. You know what I mean? Because you can develop storylines and rapport and banter yes. over that time period. It's the reason why inside the NBA works. It's the reason why you have famous commentary duos, not only in esports, but in traditional sports. But Riot has been obsessed with like breaking up talent negotiations and like, you know, keeping people on their heels so that they can't block negotiate. So they haven't had that. And I think one thing that LEC has done very well is that they have made the broadcast feel like a group of friends that have established relationships and that you, it makes me feel like I am part of that group when I watch LEC, like I'm on the inside. And LCS has always pu pushed you to the outside of that feeling. And it's hard to say, you know, it's, it's a feeling, so you can't really say, oh, we can switch this thing and like change the tone uh, or the theme of the broadcast. It's hard to nail that. And what LEC has done that, it's, it's, it's like magic that you can't replicate and that you can't necessarily account for. But they've the LCS broadcast, for lack of a better term, has never had the magic. It's never had it. Oh, it, you always feel that some people on the on the broadcast crew like vaguely dislike each other yep. or that they're stuck in the, a role because someone is saying no or because they don't trust each other enough to take risks. Like maybe the magic will be there this year, but it never has had a feeling of being fun and special. It's just not been fun. I mean, one reason why, and I'll do this as the way to wrap it up and then we'll shift to some else. Maybe we do questions from I don't know. Like, what I would say is this. If I had to di diagnose the problem, Monty, you nailed it earlier. One of the worst things you can ever get, and what you just said earlier, for me, when I used to work as talent, is death. When I hear this, I get the fuck away from the broadcast. Or I'll, I'll be real and CSGO, I was just rude. I would just tell some producer to his face, like, look, I'm going to do what the fuck I want. I'm going to get my lines off. You worry about the others, but you aren't going to tell me how to do the show. Because my problem is, when you said that thing earlier, that like producers don't want you to bring like a cool idea to them because they want it to be like they were the one who had the idea to justify their role. Soon as that bit starts, that behavior, that is death to a broadcast. Because there's a great line I always think of, Monty. I think of it with our company, with Flashpoint. You'll have heard it before. There's like a classic line. I think people claim it was like a like a fucking Reagan or quote or something. You know the quote that says something like you can get all, you know, like what you, like the limit to what you can accomplish is, is like unlimited, is endless as long as you don't worry about who gets the credit. That is the secret to all team yep. endeavors is the idea that like, as long as the outcome for everyone's the best, let's do it. But if instead what you're talking about is like that, if instead it's like, I can't ever have my cool idea because this producer has to justify that he's the cool idea guy, then you are never going to get all these great implemented things. And you are going to get like you're saying some talent. I can tell you right now, I won't say the names, but think of all the big good talents they've had on the show. They've had loads over the years. They've had fucking Jart and Raz and Marquez and Zed and fucking who else? Emily, all these good people over the years. These people have gone in, I am telling you, me and Monty know these stories. They have gone in with ideas. Here's a funny idea for a skit. Yep. Here's a I segment idea. Ideas. They go in <laughs> and these just get shot down. And the worst thing is, once you shoot enough of those ideas down and you don't do the you good ones, up. you kill people's morale for it. Like you're saying, you get to the, the end people, you can almost see by their vibe. It's sort of like, this clearly wasn't my idea, but I'll go through the motions. I'll do my best to say my thoughts. And that's the end of the show. See you next week. You get that vibe about the show. I'm with you. I got yeah, the same people will just well. go through the motion. If you shoot them down enough times, if you don't put the resources behind them and you just say, no, we're not doing that. Nope, nope, nope. There's no point. You, you're just going to give up because yes. you know it's not going to happen. And those are the producers that Riot has had for LCS. And those are not the producers that they've had for, for LEC. So it really does make a huge difference. Exactly. The, the empowering of those people. And it's obviously the key like, thing is, Monty, you want to get people who are loyal and never give up. And that's not <laughs> Ryu from back in the day on H2K talking about the team Uzi I used to play for. <laughs> now, if you know the old law, that was amazing. Work. That, <laughs> was fucking, that was straight fire. Go on. <laughs> No, it's uh, like, and it's true of many endeavors. Like, it's not just like, oh, broadcast works this way. A lot of businesses work this way as well. well but you have to, you really have to empower and enable people as a good manager. And if you don't do that, then the whole system falls apart. But don't worry, guys. All those people who did exactly those things are still. They just got promoted higher at Riot. They they they're still there. So the problem will continue forever. Basically, is what I'm saying. Unfortunately, and. As we've noticed, you know, even Riot the Games is like fucking hell. Like the worse you are, you just get promoted. 
That's how, <laughs> that's how they get you out. There's, by the way, there's even as an aside, there is an old Seinfeld episode that that was the premise, Monty. That in this premise, right, Elaine has to take over this company while her boss goes off. And she has this nightmare employee and she just figures out eventually because he's like really aggressive, intimidating. The only way you can get rid of him is you just promote him like out of your office. So eventually he becomes like, you know, <laughs> VP of product or something like, or fucking Because like, she has to get rid of him. Like, that, that's like how Riot operates. The joke is if you're good, there's shit can you within a year. If you're garbage, you're just like all the way through the whole fucking it's like a reverse tetris uh, yes we should do the nfl thing and then the, then at the, then they come to this point oh shit we can't we shouldn't do the nfl thing uh should we get rid of those people who spent years telling us that ah oh, it's fine it's whatever <laughs> they, they built their entire careers off of doing way, this when you thing. say it like that that's even a very valid actual observation think about this the people monty who are we were telling them a decade ago be your ones aren't good you got our best of fives in the playoffs everyone forgets this detail if you don't know fans when they first started the lcs and lec eu lcs the playoffs were in a weekend. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If you made top four, you skipped to top four instantly. Quarters and semis were best of three, and only the final was a best of five. And Worlds was best of three, too. In Same scenario. And you would skip to the top eight of Worlds. Like, the actual formats they did, I would say, are objectively some of the worst ever in esports history. And not only did they do the bad ones, they did them years after the good formats existed. And as you say, Monty, this is a very valid point. If all the people who, for years and years, said, this is good, this is is the right approach. This is what, why are those people not moved on when you switch her and, and essentially admit as a company that wasn't our approach? Like, you're yeah. right. That just says to me, get sense. a fresh set of people in. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole, it, it's also true that none of these people ever leave Riot Esports. You'll notice, like, they don't go and take high level positions in other companies because other companies don't want them, guys. That is they interesting. Don't have any you know have you noticed, Monty, how it doesn't work the other way around, bizarrely? Even though esports is the hot new thing, it's never like, you know, that guy who used to be like VP of product for ESL, he just joined the NFL. It's never the other way bloody round, is it? Like, a bit weird how that works. Because, spoiler, in the real world, these people actually just dive like a competence, don't they? Like, they're not good at the job. The, the thing about a lot of these, like, OG, at this point, Riot Esports people, is they can't even get jobs at other esports companies because people don't like them. Like, they have bad reputations, and they can't even make – they can't even get promoted into another company. It's very weird to think that people who are at the top of Riot Esports – or even at the mid-level of Riot Esports, they don't get moved into executive positions at other right. companies. Have you ever guys wondered about that one? Because I wonder about it. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't wonder about it. I know why. It happens. The it problem is matter. when you fork <laughs> over enough people and badmouth them and condescend to them for years and years and years, they're not going to want to work with you anymore for a score. Oh, sorry, did I say that last part out loud? That was so much shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, it, just, it was in the back of my head. Sorry, we, did, sorry. we did have that piece of... We did have that piece By of... By the way, years, since Monty... He, I mean, Monty was a little bit less subtle than I would be, but fair enough on his TikTok. All I'll say is this. I'll just say this separate of all contexts. Salute to Quickshot for one of the best tweets I've seen in ages. He won the internet that day. Masterclass in how to simultaneously have plausible deniability. But also, if you actually know the story, not just even like needle, just stick your hand right in the nerves and start fucking squeezing. Like, that was so... If you want to get... I actually genuinely, Monty, admire it in this sense. I'm not as good with impulse control, so I'm not that good at sort of like tactically sitting back and doing it. He did that perfectly, mate. He nailed that. Because he, there wasn't... He didn't... He can't... He doesn't come off bad in any context now like i said he's even got the plausible deniability what a banger what a banger tweet yeah so basically guys just so just so you know hold on let me pull up the exact wording of the of the tweet um so you guys can hear it so basically what happened was on the day that fruskerin announced that she was no longer going to be in esports or uh, I guess gaming in general. It's conveniently the... right after LEC announced their talent list, you notice, and she obviously yeah. wasn't on it. So, <laughs> you know. Even though she had gone back and done some LOL esports stuff during Worlds, which I, I just can't it? even, yep. I can't even imagine it's wild, isn't it? how you can call, say a company has systemic racism and bias, and then they rehire you to do Worlds coverage after that. It's just fucking crazy. Um. So let me let me just find let me find this tweet. It was too funny. It's actually been tweeting a lot. Here we go. Shower thought of the day. If everywhere you go things are on fire, consider that you may be the match. Uh, <laughs> which, given everything that's happened, uh, but also for you guys who don't know the context, you know, again, like I said in my my TikTok, Gigi Monte Cristo on TikTok, you can follow me. Um, 
We can't know that that was a subtweet, but we can strongly suspect because if you guys recall, not this past Worlds, but in Worlds uh, 2021. I think that was it, yeah. Yeah, uh, Quickshot like took a break. He wasn't at Worlds. He was like, I'm going to take a break for a while. Like I've had, you know, Quickshot's a friend of mine. I've had conversations about him, about that with him. Like he need, it was as I suspected at the time, he needed some personal time. Like the schedule's really grinding if you're, doing it for years and years and years because you go from LEC directly into Worlds into prepping for LEC. So he needed a break to sort out some stuff. And it had nothing to do with the the Froskeren stuff. But Froskeren did on her stream basically imply that he was a bad boss and like did bad things, but then never said what those very things vague. were. She, if you remember, she sort of made it sound like either maybe he like didn't stand up for something or maybe he like, you know, was cowardly and so some weird, it was some very weird illusion. Yeah, so people were people were speculating publicly like, oh, is it because of the thing Frost Curran said? It sounded like maybe it's connected to him being the racist one. That was like implied. Yeah, 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 yeah. which was like obviously pretty bad and not true. Um, So anyway, it was not connected, but he he did, you know, he did have to suffer a lot of public speculation about himself uh, in that moment, which I think was really unfair. And, you know, the, the, the thing about this whole Frost Curran stuff is at the end of the day, if she's leaving this industry, why doesn't she out all of Perfect the people time. who are big? Yeah. Perfect. They're not coming it. back. You, I would argue that if you know that there are bigots within this industry that are operating within Riot Games, and you know that definitively, and you are not coming back, you're going to move your life in an entirely different direction. You have an ethical obligation to out these people. If you don't get it, fans, the normal go-to excuse to justify not doing it is, but I need to work in the industry still, so if I do it right, right, it'll kill my career. Whereas if, as she said, because she was very explicit with how she phrased that, she made it sound like, like, fuck y'all, I'm off, I'm never coming back. It almost sounded like that. Well, if it's that extreme, like you say, yeah, what's left to lose? In fact, I wouldn't even say what's left to lose, mate. I'd say, what's it again? Surely we can gain a lot by getting these fuckers at least. At a minimum, at least know their names, like know who the fuck these people are. Here's something for you, Froskern. I will help you i will help you <laughs> you know we are at last free nation we're the only people who can help you with this like we can go looking around we can go talking about this we can help spread that information just show it that's all you have to do name the names show the evidence let's have a conversation i am totally down to out bigots within the esports space 100 percent. and also by the way as an aside i actually think as well that it's one thing if she just said publicly, like, you know, there's like a dodgy environment or like, I think I, I, I have my, I have my suspicions about how they hire people and what the criteria are. that will be like a professional way to phrase it. But actually the point you made there is even worse. If you then separate to that unconnected and without any explanation directly by name, call out quick shot, you have either a implied that what he did was worse than the bigots or B, like you just alluded to, you're actually implying he might be one of the bigots. Hence why you call yeah, him out yeah. by name. Whereas as far as I know, yeah, same thing. It was something completely separate and personal as far as I know she has beef with Quick Shot is. So the idea you're going to call out Quick Shot over some petty stuff, but not people you actually think. By the way, remember, because she was so brazen with how incendiary her phrasing is, she's not even just saying, I am skeptical about how they hire. She essentially implied, guys, they only hire people based on having white skin color. Like, this is not a minor thing to say. That's a pretty yeah. bold statement. If, if you knew there are people who will not hire you based on skin I want to know that info. That's pretty yes. important that we know that. Like I say, I don't, maybe we might not even be able to get them fired, but let's at least know who these people are. Call it. That is a good call out. I'd be on yeah. your side if you call that people. I'll retweet you course. instantly. Yeah, Let, let's go. Four horsemen. Like, we're there, you know? If you have the people who care in this industry who have put themselves on the line and continue to do so, even though it can cost us jobs within, yes. you know, with the... It, it, you know, it's not only jobs with the people who are calling out, it's jobs with everybody else who's afraid of, uh, you know, us calling them out down the road. You know, it really does limit a lot of our career options. But if you're going to leave, now is the f- perfect time to... to, to open the closet and show us all the skeletons, right? Let's do it. Let's clean this shit up. Um, you know, the fact that that hasn't happened made me, unfortunately, makes me believe that it's not real, um, I have to say. It sounds like a bluff. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing, mate. It just sounds like, here's the thing. It sounds like you took, like, as I say, a minor thing. Like, you just wonder, like, what the hell? I thought we were going to have that. And then you, what you did is, to get drama and a bit of conversation started, you just spun it up to the most hysterical phrasing and intentionally used incendiary fucking language. And then once you got the, 
Ascent, here's the problem, Monty. If you look at their person's actions, it's actually implied that they achieved what they wanted to achieve. They got that tweet off and they got certain conversations and outrage started, but they didn't actually achieve an, a tangible end, like get the person that they supposedly care about hired or get the person who's blocking people like that from being hired, you know? So I just find that part so disappointing in general, you know? Yeah. It's a and also, I'll say this as well. The reason to bring it all back that the quick shot tweet is a banger is because that is actually, by the way, guys, what is inferred about Frost Gorin's main problem. It's that her issue is everywhere she goes, she's on some Don Quixote shit, mate. Everywhere she goes, she just sees constant racism, sexism, bigotry, everything. Nobody's walking off. The world isn't walking off. Everything on Bali. Well, the problem in that scenario is people around you who you're essentially uh, like casting aside and eschewing, they're going to get sick of that. That's not a fun vibe, is it? Like, you can even do all that stuff, but like, you've got to do it in a very careful way. Like, in my opinion, if you're going to do political type stuff. Here's how I would say it. Do it on Twitter, but don't ever bring it up in a green room or to some guy at a company. Like, that's where it's just going to piss off your co-workers, you know, because oh. the sad thing about here is this is what gives it away to me, Monty, that it's like she's the one who changed. Because I'll give you the obvious example, right? Yeah, obviously I get why she wouldn't come to me or you. She's had her issues with me and you. Why? Right? But like, what's Richard Lewis ever done to Frost Gordon? Did I miss something? Nothing. That's what I've done. Nothing. Though, no, but at least you've had like beef <laughs> over some other minor things. Richard Lewis, as far as I know, has never had a single beef, never done anything. Else. But she won't even go to him with this info. That's suspicious as fuck to me. You know what I mean? Like when you simultaneously turn against all the same people, even like essentially he's just lumped in with us for some reason. I don't know why. He's done fuck all. <laughs> He doesn't ever, has he ever even addressed it? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I don't it. know. Or even Jacob Wolf, mate. What's, Jacob sure. Wolf is even in our group. Well, he can't uh, break your story. That's why I'm sorry. The actual conclusion at the end of it all, mixed with a little bit of behind the scenes info, is it's made up. It's a bluff. It's you can even, it's, it's not even just Jacob Wolf. Or an Wolf. exaggeration. You, just, you, know. you can just go to the fucking Washington Post. Oh, you could go loads of it. Yeah, that guy who's doing all those articles with like a fucking East European sounding name, whatever. Yeah. What about, what about, what about Cecilia, who's reporting for Bloomberg now? I mean, right? here's the real joke, Monty, is there's a million people. Like, I'm actually even being too fair picking people I like. Think about it. People I don't like do outrage click stories all the time. Liz Richardson, the fucking Cecilia, De 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 Stars. You think these people wouldn't love a story where they get to break a story? Riot Games, yes, the same Riot Games I got in trouble all those years ago, have fucked over a woman and don't like, give me a... That said, lay up. That is the, to them, that's like the idea of doing 360 dunk in the dunk contest. It's the best part. To 10, 10, 10, you've got a 50. Like, yeah, that's that's the problem. You are right. When you think it through, she's either just genuinely going like, it's a secret, none of you allowed to. It's either that or she just, it's a bluff. It's nonsense in it. I know. It's, it's the, like, it's can't the be world's true. dumbest secret, though. That's the whole thing, is it? That's why. That's this why is the problem. Really why if we sense. ended up with this, like, Everyone here is blindingly white and it's a sexist environment. Oh, for scoring, please tell us what's going on. Nope. All right, then keep your secrets like that fucking shit. Also, the here's some money to come back and do shows with us. <laughs> 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 I like I like how I can do nothing and get banned from Riot and blacklisted forever. And uh, she could just basically imply that they're systemically bigoted and uh, continue to get work. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> totally reasonable. <laughs> that must be why she had to move over to Pokemon Unite because obviously when it comes to walkism, she's got to catch them all. Every mind virus, every single well, one of them, everyone. I, 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 and I think, also, I by think... the way, as an aside, I'll also say this as well. I think actually for real, the saddest thing about the Froskoran story in League of Legends is, and this is so fucked up, is she actually is someone who succeeded in spite of fans. Like, the fans were so hard on her the first years that I actually thought she was one of those people, they're borderline, like, you just quit eventually. You just go, I can't be bothered pushing the boulder up the hill again. She didn't. She broke through, and she broke through to the extent, and this very rarely happens, that she was winning the haters over. Like, you guys might not remember this. Froskoran used to actually have the opposite public persona. She used to go onto Reddit, even at the height of her game, and she would directly reply to criticism and say like oh hey this is Frost Gorin here like I saw you made this tweet like you know and then she would she wouldn't even attack the person by this she wouldn't even do what I would do which is you just dunk on the guy like you fucking idiot she would like just take their point and like genuinely address it and in doing so by the way she turned around so many convos because so many people would sort of see like oh she could have like dunked on me attacked me but she just like addressed my point and they'd be like oh sorry about that Frost Gorin. maybe I phrased it the wrong way I just thought that you should have mentioned it and she was actually for real like it was all everything was headed in the right way every marker was taken up she was doing the world's finals and then the, the years or unironically when she just did 
introduced all this political stuff has just undone all that good work. And the worst part to me is this, Monty, is that the original dickhead haters from like season four and season five who just hated her because she was a woman or they just don't like her personality, they get to seem at the end like I was right all along. It's like, you weren't, you idiot. It was never actually the League of Legends stuff was she was good. bad at. No, she was <laughs> mega at that. The real problem was it was all the other shit. It was the extracurricular yeah. stuff. I, 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 she you was know, mega I, at her job. I think that's what's so sad about this whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, why the legacy is just ruined in it. Why why we're having this conversation is because she was good and she actually brought a very different energy and opinions and combativeness to the desk that I thought was was very fun to watch. All the and things so, people don't like about her personality now, Monty, were perfect. I'll give you an example. Back in the era when everyone said Koreans were the best, how amazing is it that you have a woman come in with a totally unique approach and she's like, no, I think the LPL is going to become the best. That was the shit. That was, I know she was a couple of years off, but like that, that was, we needed that on desks. It couldn't be everyone just agrees Korea wins. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I think she very bravely stood up against the Neom deal yep. and, you know, other things. So, like, you know, she doesn't deserve to be to be shit on in a lot of these ways. And we can appreciate all the things that were really great about her and her contributions to League of Legends and to our entertainment. I think the real pitfall is that and, and you know, I I have this issue, too. Like people get tired of me bagging on Riot because I have a lot of reasons. I was treated extremely unfairly and brutally by Riot. Um, and you know, I have my grievances with them and I have to remind myself that not everybody wants to hear about my fucking grievances because at the end of the day, people aren't, people are looking for entertainment and for fun and to engage in their favorite pastime, which is playing league of legends or another video game and talking about esports. And if you fill all of your content with that vitriol, which may be justified, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, not everybody wants to spend their free time listening to that, right? And so you have to make it fun for people and you have to engage them in that way. And you have to you have to provide a lot of sugar to make the medicine go down at the oh, end. Man, and that's have, the craziest they have to part. like you to fight yes. for you. They that's have to also like the you to fight for you. That's also the weirdest part about that phrasing that she publicly said, like that they should have fought with her, Monty. Because the thing that's killing me is like I just implied there. She was the person who was annoying in every green room. Like, the difference is, you might not know this, guys, but one of the reasons why you have never seen talent come out against me and Richard Lewis in CSGO is because our green rooms are the best. Like, you might think, oh, I bet you're all... No, it's all just fun. What we try to do is keep the mood as lighthearted as possible. Keep everyone... In fact, what you try and do is you try and include everyone in the jokes and the fun. And in fact, if you ever know, Monty, that there's an area where the two of us would argue, you intentionally never address that. You never talk about, like, religion or fucking politics. You leave all that shit out and you just make it... A, what you try and make it feel like is... We, we have the best job in the world. We're all paid to watch this bloody video again. Now let's watch it and come up with some fun angles. If you do that, everyone will love you. Everyone will be on your side. But I, that's the problem with that statement. I, I agree with Monty is. Even though I agree in principle, she's right. If, if there is a real claim that people are doing fucked up, unethical, immoral stuff, then everyone should stand up and fight. But as you say, like if you're the person where everyone, everyone doesn't have a reason to be kind to you or engendered to you or think you've, you haven't won them over, basically, they're not going to stand with you. Like They're not going to put their gig on the line. Come yeah, and it's not just your colleagues; it's the fan too. Fans Everyone, too. They have yeah. to li they have to like you in yes. order to want to go to battle with you and to like you know listen to you and and try and support you and your beliefs. And I think the main problem with Froskerin is I do believe that probably some legitimate bad things happened that she was aggrieved about, and I, we know that that's the case because of like the Neom deal was like pretty bad, um, and especially somebody um, you know who wouldn't be welcomed within Saudi Arabia, right? Like that's, you know, it's, I think it's really hard to have your identity attacked in that way. But at the same time, like the more you, you can be very personally concerned about that, but the more it becomes your entire character, the less fun you become. And when people are looking to you to have fun, then it becomes difficult to, um, to continue to get them on their side. You become one note and tiresome, but not everybody is on board with that with you in the medium you're doing it. So this is all to say that I hope that her, her next career is more fulfilling because I know she really does want to make a difference. And I hope that her next career will be in an area where she can do that. Um, without having to, like I said, create all the sugar to make the medicine go down. There are careers you can have. Just go into politics. You know what I mean? Go into nonprofits. Like you can make a difference and and be much more, I think, bold and and bald faced about those ambitions within different fields. But entertainment is a hard one to do that in.
It's a hard one. By the way, do we are we actually doing any questions on this episode? Uh, no. Well, that, we'll just oh, wrap hold it on. Then. That's it, right? Hold on, my leg is cramping. Oh, uh, yeah. We're gonna no no questions, guys. As a reminder, the we'll be announcing on our Discord, which you should absolutely join for Last Free Nation. The way we're gonna be doing questions in the future, we have shut down the Grog Coin project. Uh, so be sure to get in your emails to us if you haven't yet. All of that information is in the Grog Coin channel pinned to it. And we'll be doing more questions in the future. Um, as a note, um, we are going to be doing Best Damn League show tomorrow. So that started. Monty and Wolf show, if you missed that, about the first week of LCK, where Wolf and I go in depth. That came out yesterday. Power Spike is going to be starting on Monday with me, Dom, and Degon. And the CSGO stuff is also starting on our CS channel. So it's a great time to subscribe to our Twitch and YouTube. Follow us everywhere. And on TikTok, a lot of clips from the podcast, funny moments, and other content's going to be coming out on there too. So follow Last Free Nation everywhere. We'll see you next time.